premium SUVs comparison, internal combustion engine versus the electric versions. Today in our show with the BMW X5 versus the BMW iX, Mercedes GLE versus Mercedes EQE SUV, Genesis GV70 versus Genesis GV70 EV, an Audi Q8, yes, the Q8, that was our most recent episode, that's why, versus the Audi Q8 e-tron. The Genesis is a little bit smaller, however, in this segment, they already have the combustion engine version next to the very same EV version. That's why they're here today. For which vehicle would I pick the electric one? For which would I pick the internal combustion engine and why? And how do they compare to each other? Let's find out. Let's go. Today I have the Mercedes GLE facelift for you, including a driving part with Thomas in 4K full screen, full length. Let's go with the front with new headlamps, new signature. And then we have the optional multi-beam LED, four dot design right here, white vehicle in AMG line. Then you have this one horizontal spoke, whereas the base Mercedes GLE has two horizontal spokes. Here the AMG line also comes with this micro star pattern and also a different graphic in the lower side part, whereas the base version once again would have a more subtle look. The front indicators here replace the data running light. That looks quite fancy, doesn't it? And in the driving part later on, we will compare and drive GLS 450 versus GLE 53. The length at 4 meters 92 or 194 inches has remained the same. Wheels now start bigger, 19 inch up to 22 inch. These here are somewhat in between 21 inch, but already massive enough from the looks. AMG line has the wheel arches and vehicle color, whereas the baseline, yo baseline, has it in the crossover wheel arches. And typical for GLE is always this design graphic right here. As for suspensions, you start with the base steel suspension, but that one already has adaptive dampers. Optional airmatic air suspension, we also have it here, and optional, optional. The e-active body control, it can also lean in the corners, so we can go this low rider style and so on. We'll have the normal air suspension for today. The rear with new tail lamps, and when you have the AMG line, then you have this high gloss black in the lower part, and our look of fake exhaust police is reporting another set of fake exhausts. And a quick look at the turning indicators, not that spectacular. And as a comparison, this is the 63 model, 63S. Now gets the logo on top of the hood, the AMG logo. And here, 53 and 63, get the AMG front grille with the vertical fins. 53 and 63 are different in the lower side part here, where the 63 looks a little bit more massive. You can go up to 22 inch. Here you can also see the 22 inch in the AMG styling, really massive. Here also with the optional carbon ceramic brake. And in the rear you have this diffuser style in the central part and the exhaust tips. Yeah, real one is on the inside. The outer fuel fake exhaust police is always watching for you. The fake safe changes also account for the GLE Coupe and it always starts in the AMG line. This is here a 53 model, so it also has a true AMG grille. But these sides here in the lower part, this is the same in AMG line and also in the 53 model. The coupe always, of course, characterized by this falling roof line. It does split opinions. Are you team love or team hate? As for the SUV coupe thing, tell me in the comments. In the US, by the way, the coupe only available as GLE 53 or 63. On the European markets, you have a wider engine choice also for the coupe version. Key fob in matte black and not high gloss black piano like I prefer that way actually. Door closing sound. Really solid light and also the panel gaps, well built. Inside of the doors, I prefer these models here from Mercedes where you still have a haptic feedback at the seat controls and not without the feedback here. Also styling elements you can also find in a GLS for example with this deco element. Also news taken from a GLS, even from the Maybach, is here the galvanized tops here at the air vents on the left side and that goes throughout the vehicle. New steering wheel. Looks pretty fancy, this is the base steering wheel, but then has the capacitive BS buttons. So I think I preferred the previous one in that case. With an AMG line or true AMG, you also get the two horizontal spokes then at the steering wheel. Dual insulation glass here, by the way. Seats here, the animal skin. How do you see it? One, two, three, four, five, six patterns here. The Artico MBTX has four patterns. 
yeah, other than that, it's hard to differentiate. The article available in black, gray, and also new brown color updated. 189 or 6 for 2 is the headroom here. It's good command driving position indeed. GLS and GLE don't differ so much in the front driving position. It's more about the rear differences then. In the overview, you can see this galvanization here at the design element and also here now at the air vent, so a little bit improved quality. Different decor elements available here. To me, it's a little bit too much high gloss black piano lacquer. I would prefer a matte wood. What would you? To me, always very important that you can still set the climbing tool manually and with a very rich clicking sound. MUX infotainment system update. I think it's quicker than before, just more responsive. And Apple CarPlay, also wireless. Of course, also Android Auto works. Burmester sound system tries to be, you know, this very true sound, keeping to the original source. I like the sound indeed. And there's then also this new off-road mode available. You have here this off-road view, and then also a special off-road camera live feed around that. And as soon as you go forward here, it builds up this past camera image. And there you can see I'm going over this puddle here, for example. So you always see if there's something between the tires to prevent damage. The head-up display is indeed a very impressive one. Look at how large it is, very clear as well. And you also have off-road head-up display, eco, you can have different settings there, a standard one reduced or a sporty head-up display. So much to choose from. And the digital instruments with integrated map from the car internal GPS or map full screen. And my favorite are the new off-road gauges here that just looks coolest from the visualization or once again go classic or with the sporty gauges. Middle console and the front part, you slide this one open, inductive charging pad. The cup holders are not holding the bottles too tight, but you can cool or heat them, that's pretty cool. Then you have here this touchpad where you can use alternatively to the touch screen, so you can also control the infotainment driving mode selection here. And and you have the air suspension, that option, you can also lower or raise the vehicle manually. Last but not least, this split armrest. Panoramic roof is really wide and you can also open it completely. Really like also this crystalline look here of the top inside interior lamps. And here we go. Let's go a little bit further. That's it. Rear bench. Actually, the door opens quite wide, so you have easy access and also for child seats and so on. Isofix at the outside parts. The bench is quite short and also falls backward a little bit. That's maybe to me not the best in comfort, also if you compare it to, for example, the BMW X5. But what is better here is the legroom. Because of the design of the rear bench, you have more legroom actually than in some of the competitors. That's actually decent. And the headroom also for tall people, no problem at all. The middle seating here is Surprisingly soft in the middle part for the seating area, just a little bit stiff than here from this back area. And you now also have two USB-C chargers at the rear. The trunk, 825 liters, up to over 2,000 liters. You have here this cover, which doesn't have rails at the side because you can also get a seven-seater for the GLE, but I think it doesn't make any sense more than in the GLS. Here, the width is actually quite good, 110 or 44 inches, and the normal length is about a meter or 40 inches, so that's good. And the total height here is 85 centimeters or 33 inches, very good measurements. To fold the seats, you have to grab over here. Um, it is possible, though. And if you went for the AMG line or have a true AMG model, 5363, then you have the steering wheel here with two horizontal spokes. This is also the one with the microfiber sides, can really recommend it. You can also get different decor elements like the carbon fiber here and also sportier seats, also with some microfiber share at least. But you can also get, depending from market to market, a full Dynamica microfiber on the inside and with the AMG line or the 53 model at least. Rear headroom in the coupe, the panoramic roof is not as long and so it rises here again towards the rear and then you see still enough headroom left indeed. And a quick comparison to the boot or trunk of the coupe, length width more or less the same of course and here the different cover. The difference is that you lose height here in that latter area. In most cases you will be able to live with that. Engine lineup, 2 liter 4 cylinders petrol and diesel, 3 liter 6 cylinder petrol and diesel. 4 liter V8 petrol engine in the 580 or in the 63 model. The 53 model gets also the 3 liter 6 cylinder. But 
To me, the sweet spot is the 3 liter 6 cylinder petrol engine in the GLE 450 indeed. You can also get base engine, for example, in the US with the 350, that one even just with rear wheel drive. News is that all are equipped now with mild hybrid system and plug-in hybrids are also available, both petrol and diesel. Welcome to Thomas's driving lounge with the Mercedes GLS 450 facelift, 381 horsepower, now mild hybrid system, and 5.6 seconds is the acceleration figure to my goodness now, or 62 miles an hour. Air suspension already helps here in city driving to even out some bumps and so on. I wouldn't say that it is a super soft setup. You do feel still it's an air suspension, that's good. Um, but it's also not that it's leaning too much in the corners. Very interesting is I found that with an early driving test, GLE and GLS, that when you have the e-active body control, it's also feeling a little bit stiffer. You know, you have this leaning into the corner possibility then. At the same time, I feel that you lose a little bit of comfort just, you know, from this evening out things. That was quite quick, to 35 miles an hour. Wow, that went well. So this engine here is definitely more than sufficient as for the power. Uh, do you really need an AMG version? Of course, it's a different kind of thing, but for most use cases, this is totally fine as for the acceleration. Here in the corner, you can see, doesn't lean too much from the air suspension, but the seats actually don't hold you that tight. There is also, depending on the market spec, the Dynamica microfiber available. There's like a microfiber on the inside. It exists in the AMG line, if that's available in your market. And this one actually keeps you a little bit tighter in the seat, so I can recommend that. Then now here on the motorway, 65 miles an hour, so around 100 kilometers an hour. Noise insulation is really good, it's very silent in here. We've also seen the dual insulation glass at first. In the sport mode, already when you have the base suspension, the suspension goes a little bit stiffer. Here in the Airmatic air suspension, of course, even more so. And you can go back from the drive mode select to the comfort mode, then the suspension is evening out. The waves, for example, a little bit softer, a little bit better. You can drive in any mode it will still be fine actually. As for the assistance systems, setting in here on the left side of the steering wheel, there is this active lane keeping assist. See here it's not too proactive. I had to correct myself now. Now it's catching it. There we go. So here now I'm being kept in the lane. Of course, I'll never trust it 100%, for example, when it's a meeker at the side or something. But it can be something to, let's say, relax a little bit more on the motorway. Just keep your hands in the steering wheel and then let the car do like the, the fine nuances and so on. How does it behave in a lane change? It's really nice, very smooth indeed. And steering uh, doesn't have a dead zone area. There is always reaction and it actually feels quite natural. And in agile driving corners, we'll see, is it also sporty fun in the riding? And for the agile driving part here, countryside, I go once again to the sport mode to give as a little bit more feedback from suspension. Let's see difference here, steering, comfort mode, sport. Yeah, I also get more feedback from the steering. That's actually cool. You could also set an individual mode. For example, if you say suspension soft, but then more feedback from the steering, that would be my tip for today for an individual driving mode, actually. The normal air suspension is a little bit stiffer here. The curved mode in the e-active body control would now lean into the corners, but it's such an expensive option and in the normal driving behavior, I think a normal air suspension setup is cooler actually because it's a little bit softer then. So I would stick either base suspension, go lower budget or then go with the normal air suspension. I feel it's also good control here in the steering when I'm in the corners, don't have to head to steer that much. That's fine. Also when I, for example, accelerate out of a corner, then you have the rear wheel bias, even if you have the all-wheel drive. That's also good that you can have some fun actually getting out of the corners right here. So we felt at home on the motorway. In the city, it's not too big. And here also, it's agile enough. It does give you driving fun. And the only thing is here, when you have the slick surface with the seats, they don't offer too much side support. You get used to it, it's okay, but that could be maybe a little bit better. 
other than that it also very well handles this discipline here the fuel economy if you have some steady driving mainly motorway like 60 miles an hour 100 kilometers an hour you can indeed score some good figures of 9 liters or more kilometers 26 mbg us 31 mbg uk of course more going up in the mountain then it's a little bit worse and in the us it will always be a little bit more efficient like here at this moment in europe you can calculate with a little bit higher consumption because of the opf the particle filter for also for the petrol engine for example Welcome to Thomas's Driving Lounge, now with the 53, the GLE 53, also as the Coupé, I'll put it in the Sports Plus mode and let's accelerate it out. Whoa, that was like already 40 miles an hour and I even didn't like, that was like 80% of the pedal. Really nice and how smooth you see in the steering wheel, it was like an acceleration out of the corner from standstill, really nicely done, so a very, very controlled acceleration rear wheel bias of course with this all-wheel drive system here so you always get out of the corners very well difference is you have the same base engine so to speak but here with more horsepower tune 435 horsepower and with the facelift with the electrification this vehicle profits from it because it has even more power or even more boost so the 450 at 5.6 seconds, then this one here was at 5.3, but now with the facelift at 5 seconds. So there's now a 0.6 second difference in the acceleration figure, 450 to the 53 model. So just more boost, more punch then, and also you heard it, just more sound. Of course, the exhaust is different and also in the sound emulation on the interior even more so. You just hear more something also this blop 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 when you get off the throttle the air suspension is here also set on a stiffer note and for the 53 is an option standard for the 63 you can also get the anti-tilt control so the car just stays more upright so indeed this one feels way better here in tighter corners so you don't you, have, you feel as there would be less g-force applied the seats also hold to tight a little bit more they have also some microfiber share same goes for the steering wheel with microfiber share which gives me just more control over the vehicle so here definitely the recipe the more <laughs> microfiber you can get the better it is for the sporty driving and indeed i have more fun driving this one here than the 450 in the corners of course there's also a hefty extra price but it just gives you more sporty feeling being here in this full-size SUV. At least for European taste, it's a full-size <laughs> it's, it's full SUV. So this is here, or these are the roads where the GLE 53 can really play out its advantages. Do we need the V8 for the 63? Not necessarily. This engine is way you know, more than enough power-wise, and the 53 is to me also a sweet spot. Remember that in the US you can only get the coupe as 53 or 63. So when you're from the US or North American market, this one would be then the coupe to go for actually. And here also once again, out of the corners, really nice, good control of the steering, very natural, and I don't have to steer too much. So having a lot of fun in these corners than here. So this is just a sporty difference and together with the different styling, visualization, also here with the carbon fiber and so on, it feels quite different to the normal GLS 450 indeed. It's just a question, do you desire this sporty driving feeling or would you rather say like, ah, you know, I am buying the GLS more for the relaxed comfort and so on. Then of course, you might as well just stick with the 450. Both, of course, do a good job overall. Is this the best Mercedes EV yet? A full driving review of the Mercedes EQE SUV with Thomas and Autogefühl in 4K full screen, full length. Let's go here. You can see the closed front grille here with an optional micro star pattern. Very beautiful design indeed. This is the AMG line. That means sporty accentuations in the side lower part. We'll soon also comparing the electric art line. This color is also very special. It's called Alpine Gray. It's a special AMG color actually for the AMG line here. And we also have a beautiful shooting location here on the Portuguese coastal line. 4 meters 86 or 191 inches is the length of the EQE SUV. So the smaller brother to the EQS SUV. 
This is more than in a competition, for example, with the BMW iX wheels from 19 to 22 inch. These here are the 21 inch wheels. At the side, you can open this one here for the wiper fluid, for example, but you cannot open the hood. There's an optional HEPA filter underneath when you order that one. And technology news here for the EQE SUV is you can, if you have the all-wheel drive version, it means one like the motor in the rear, one in the front, decouple the front electric motor so that you have efficiency gains when you do not need it. But you can also get an entry version with rear-wheel drive only. Testing here the EQE 500, that is an all-wheel drive model. And these technology updates that come with this vehicle here will also go to the other Mercedes EV models like the normal EQE, the EQS and so on, EQS SUV. But this one here starts it. And there's the second news, not only decoupling of the front wheels, but also standard heat pump now, so you will have less range losses in winter time. This one here visually comes with this side step here, this really cool design element and also aerodynamic performance. And then here we more have a coupe line, I would say, and with a very strong shoulder area. Another technology highlight leads us to the rear axle because the rear axle steering, that's an option, can turn the rear wheels in the opposite direction than the front wheels up to 10 degrees. That massively reduces the turning circle by up to 2 meters, easier U-turns and so on. And design-wise here in the rear you can see this light strip going across and on the sides you have this 4 element spiral whereas the EQS SUV would have this 5 element spiral. Very interesting. In the lower part, AMG line. Are these even pretending to be fake exhaust? <laughs> what do you think? And battery size, by the way, it's always around 90 kilowatt hours. You might see in the price list, there are some versions with 89 and others with 91. They don't differ that much. It's just from a different supplier, but the charging times are also pretty much similar. It's always around 30 minutes from 10 to 80% state of charge. If you have the biggest power boost, which is at 170 kilowatt peak. Turning indicators replace the daytime running light in the front and the rear turning indicators at first sight it doesn't look that spectacular but when you look closer it uses these vertical structures and that looks quite cool then. Also features a very cool welcoming light signature. Look at that when I open the vehicle how the light builds up. There we go. Pretty spectacular. By the way, not to be recommended, but yeah, sometimes I just can't help myself and also do fun things with vehicles, which are not useful. Yeah, <laughs> not releasing the parking brake and then slightly applying the throttle. Again, don't do it, but it looks weird, all right? <laughs> and here we can very well see with the two Alpine Grey AMG color cars, here the side steps. We have it on our main vehicle and here it's the same color, but without that side step. It really looks different, but which one would you prefer? Aerodynamics wise, by the way, the sidestep is better. It actually serves aerodynamics because the air is being channeled in a better way underneath the vehicle to the rear. And more colors for you. Here, for example, a subtle blue, a rather darker blue tone, but I think it suits the vehicle very well with the same 21 inch wheels. Or what about here, this diamond white bright vehicle? You have more contrast than here with the wheel arches in that case. 19 inch wheels so you can see how the car looks like with smaller wheels yeah the bigger wheels do look better right but then with the air suspension you can also even out this comfort difference and here we can also see a difference amg line with the sport here accentuations in the lower part and the electric art line is a little bit more subtle has this more closed look not that sporty and also more chrome in the lower part more set on elegance and here you can also see that this star pattern it's just an option, doesn't have anything to do with AMG or not AMG line. But hey, it does kind of look cool with the tiny stars, doesn't it? And this is how it looks like in silver or what about in all black. Moving towards the interior, this is the key fob, really premium alike, I like that. Then here the door handles, flush, integrated, and then you can open them like this. They are an option in the EQ SUV and I think yeah, it's a little bit over-engineered. Then dog closing sound. It's really solid. Inside of the doors, this material is called Neotex. It's a new material, neoprene-alike. It's a mix of microfiber and leatherette. Feels cool, looks cool, really nice. Then here at the inside of the doors, you also see this nice integration of the ambient lighting also here around. Just a high-gloss piano lacquer here and the lacking haptic feedback of the seat controls, what I would criticize. 
This is the AMG line interior, soon going to compare the electric art interior. Here also with the optional hyperscreen, which looks fancy, but is it worth it? Soon more deals to that. Here the steering wheel, AMG line with two spokes, left and right. The electric art steering wheel would look different. And these seats here are the comfort seats. They are sports seats and comfort seats. Also in the AMG line, you can go here for the comfort seats. The sport seats not available in the US and they are also more narrow. Here the comfort seats are definitely better. Here with the animal skin wrap and you see here it already looks old and it feels kind of rough and hard so not good material quality and here we can see soon that the electric art Artico cover is way better indeed. Seating position I'm really happy with that actually. Good comfort here on these comfort seats and even more than in the electric art with the full Artico interior. This is also better than in the sedans because here you sit a little bit more upright and with 189 or 6 foot 2 you also have enough headroom. This is also the version here with the panoramic roof by the way and it leaves a lot of light in. Really cool. You can also open it. That's also cool. Is it very well usable? Hmm, more or less because yeah, already like 60 kilometers now or something there are, there are a lot of wind noises so it's not the best panoramic roof to drive at higher speeds. You have to know that if that is then relevant for you or not. Rear doors, here also with the high grade leather and the Neotex on the top part. It's really well done as for the build quality. Then you can see no middle tunnel, purpose built EV platform. That's good actually. And since everything is more upright, and although you have the shorter wheelbase than the EQE sedan, you have a lot of legroom here. It's no problem at all. Headroom also works for tall L's, so five tall L's is fine. Just that the middle seat is a little bit hard at the back part. The outer seats are definitely way more comfortable. And in the lower part, we also have a separate climate unit here, but it's this one button design again, and below that, two USB-C chargers. And here we can fold down the cup holders. This is like a smartphone holder, and then like this, you can release the cup holders. Interior cockpit overview. This is here the optional hyperscreen, like one glass unit, 17.7 in the middle, 12.3 inch on the sides each. This is the passenger screen, which now is featuring this personalization with your favorite image, or maybe, or maybe also of your dog, your cat, or your wife, or your husband. So, which one would you actually put there at the uh, at the passenger screen? This is optional, however, and I'm not sure if you would go for that because it is really expensive, can be up to like 8,000 euros extra. And the base setup here, we can also soon show that to you, is to me actually a little bit nicer even. Here are the digital instruments, nice visualization. You can also pick the style, sport your way or understated, or then the map full screen. And wow, this is cool here with the satellite view, definitely. My favorite is off-road that, yeah, just looks coolest, doesn't it? And the head-up display is really large and you can also have some GPS visualizations in there. Some love it, some think it's too much. The ambient lighting, I found it pretty cool, actually. You have this color transitions, if you like. You can also change the whole color and either in a multi-color way or maybe also just a single color so you can really pick that and what's also quite cool is that when you use the ac unit you can see warmer or colder as an additional visualization what are you actually doing apple carplay or android auto integration is really massive indeed and also works quite quickly wireless or wired both is possible burmester sound system or burmester is really Wow, good sound and they concentrate on having the original source basically transported to the sound system as accurately as possible. That's their goal. Then you can also see the satellite view in full glory. Wow, look at this. That looks really, really cool, right? Here, for example, you can see that here from the sites in Lisbon. That looks, wow. Like, like in the game, right? <laughs> and new with this software version introduced by the GLC is here that you have the see-through bonnet with that camera. This is the live camera feed and this then here in the middle part is being built up while driving from a past camera image. But here you can see it helps that you can see if there's a sharp stone underneath the bonnet and maybe damaging the tires or something. The passenger screen is only active when there's someone on the seat with a seat sensor and then 
you basically have the mirroring of everything else, but you can also have video streaming while driving. That's the difference, and the driver then cannot see it. Beautiful matte wood decor. Hmm, really cool. And then inductive charging pad, two USB-C chargers, but also here the adaptive cup holders. But when you have like heavier glass bottles or something, small ones, they don't hold them that tight. And let's make it clean close again. Here, this uh, unit for the driving mode selection, for example, and start stop of the vehicle. Then you have the split armors with more space underneath. Not to forget this huge space here underneath the middle console with more charging possibilities. Let's also take a look at the electric art interior we have here, starting at the instant of the doors, with, uh, you know, with these nice new materials that has neoprene finish. And listen to that. Also, you know, when you touch it, how it sounds, really cool indeed. This is also the base steering wheel. That one looks better in the AMG trim, I think, because again, in AMG you have the two spoke design. Here, there's one spoke design. But this interior is also without any animal materials and the steering wheel feels good. And also here with the seats, this is very astonishing. This here actually looks better and feels softer. And look at this different cockpit. This does not feature the optional hyper screen. Then you have this vertical layout, like we know from a C-Class or the S-Class and so on. And you have here space for decor element and you can pick different stylings. So a very interesting 3D structure underneath here. So I found actually more beautiful without the hyper screen. And also here the digital instruments are not integrated, they're more upright and they give you actually better visibility because when it's leaned backwards then the sun can also uh, get to that a little bit better here this way better view so this solution here saves money and to me it is also better as for the user interface what do you think we flip the logo here to open the trunk or the boot 520 liters up to 1675 and then here there says no rails at the side but it's actually good in the build quality and then underneath here we also have a lot of space for charging cables the length here is 94 centimeters or 37 inches and the width is also between the wheel arches yeah easily a meter or 40 inches you can see it here and the total height is also important it's actually quite substantial 72 centimeters or 28 inches so this is how you can use the trunk you can also fold the seats right here but you have to grab over there's no remote lock or something and then you can load through the front seats. Welcome to Thomas's driving lounge. We start with the sport mode acceleration slightly uphill but does it have really enough power? Let's go! Stop! That's 90 kilometers an hour. Woo! That went really quick. I mean the official figure was five seconds like what 4.9. Whoo! More punch from the rear from the strong electric motor. Wow, I was really pushed into the seat. That was a lot of fun, really cool. And we first check out the agile driving characteristic here because the EQE is shorter than the EQS SUV. And so also gives us more driving fun. It feels definitely more agile. This year even has a shorter wheelbase than the EQE sedan. Very interesting concept indeed. However, due to the low center of gravity in these electric vehicles, the batteries are placed in the middle bottom part the difference between driving a sedan and an SUV body type is slimmer here with electric vehicles than it is with combustion engine models. We have no shaking up effect or something. In the sports mode here, this optional air suspension is set on a stiffer note, so there is no rolling or something really cool. The rear axis steering at higher speed gives us rather more stability because then it turns into the same direction than the front wheels at lower speed. Soon going to show that as well. It helps with turning circle and also easing the car in and out in the city and parking lots and so on. And yeah, this is a lot of fun indeed. Pretty cool. It is not the most sporty EV overall there is. There are sportier EVs out there, but considering what you expect from the outside, how the car looks, doesn't look like a sports SUV or something. It's also not supposed to be one, but it is really decently quick and it is still fun to drive. The steering input is really natural and likable and you see you don't have to steer that much. Mercedes has changed that with recent new models. Before that you had to always steer quite a lot with Mercedes, more set out on comfortable driving straight and so on. Now you have to steer less without you know it being too sensitive or something. I think they found a very good um, solution here 
that it's sporty, fun to drive. You don't have to steer too much, but still remain with this very natural steering character. So, in this case, I think, very well done. And also here in the city, since we have that shorter wheelbase and the other models feels actually pretty much at home, you can ease that here around also on more narrow roads and so on. No problem at all. Most important thing in city driving is when you have the optional rear axle steering in the highest build, up to 10 degrees, the rear axle goes in the opposite direction in the front wheels and situations like these, that it feels like you would be turning on standstill, you know, like, all, like wow, that's really amazing. I mean, it's not a small vehicle at all, but this option actually reduces the turning circle by two meters. So this has essentially a turning circle of a small vehicle. Did you hear this chime, by the way? It's very interesting, this new law for European vehicles, which are coming new to the market, new homologation, that actually you need to have a warning chime as soon as you exceed the speed limit, even if it's just one kilometer an hour. And the thing is really, it can be very annoying because, I mean, let's be serious, when it's 40 kilometers an hour here and I maybe hit like 41, who cares? That has nothing to do with speeding or being dangerous or something. We all agree that especially in the city, especially like where children are present, everyone has to slow down and drive the according speed limit and watch out. No doubt about that, you know. I'm not, I mean, I'm absolutely pro, you know, keeping the skip speed limits, but keeping it realistic and not annoying for the driver. I think that's that's the key thing. Mercedes has thought of that. That's very interesting. So when you exceed it once by just, you know, maybe a small minor or policia, <laughs> then you can either click the small symbol here on the screen. There's like a um, traffic sign symbol with a, with a speaker or the alternative would, would, would be to hold the mute button for a second and then actually this chime is being muted. By law, once again, this is reactivated every time you restart the vehicle. Yeah, and with some vehicles, we had, for example, with the Neo vehicles, we had really funny experiences because it was like very loud, annoying. Maybe it's done like by voice assistant that it really literally tells you you have exceeded the speed limit. Here, this chime, but I think it's pretty cool that they directly thought of that to have actually two very easily accessible shortcuts to turn that chime off. Yeah, this is the thing where the development of the car industry is heading to. Everything is more and more automated and things are getting also more and more annoying. Some things, improvement in safety are good and also help us. Some new technology feature are beneficial for customers, also for safety and so on. But if that's really so beneficial, I don't know. What do you think? And motorway 80 to 120. Top, that's it. it. Was even a little bit more, so that was slightly down about the power is definitely there. And here, Portuguese motorway, 120 kilometers an hour is maximum this part here. And super side in here, although it's quite windy outside, close to the sea, it's quite normal, but the noise insulation from the windows and so on is really very good. We have the optional air suspension in this very vehicle and it really gives us good floating comfort. With the 21 inch wheels, of course, when you have some fierce bumps in the road, then you do feel them. If you would go for smaller wheels, you could even that out better. But I like that the air suspension is not too hard actually. And you can also adjust a little bit by the driving mode here in the S sports mode. It's a little bit stiffer here in the comfort mode then you have more floating effect. and that really gives you good comfort definitely while driving so you can enjoy it at least from the comfort aspect also on the motorway also long term even better than with the shown article seats because of the softer surface if that, that's available on your market as for the assistance systems you can sit here on the steering wheel adaptive cruise control ruling back and forth and also left and right here with the active steering here on the Portuguese motorway, they are not that high in speed compared to Germany, but here you can see, we can very well test because there are quite a lot of times that like bend, especially here in this Lisbon area. Here right side, so I didn't steer at all. So you see very smooth reaction here from this active steering assist. That is indeed also well done. If you, by the way, go on the brakes, then you always have recuperation, but 
hardly any in the normal recuperation mode. And then you can adjust it here at the shifting pedal, so to speak. For example, you can go left for strong recuperation, then you have much deceleration when you go off the throttle, or on the right side, no recuperation. Or then the last setting is the auto. And that is doing, for example, when I'm closer here to a vehicle in front of me, and have the auto, and then I go off the throttle, then I have recuperation, for example. But then when the sensor is not picking up anything here, when I have more freeway, there's no recuperation, it's just rolling. And I think that's a good setting. There's always the discussion between predictability or making it purpose-built, you know what I mean? And you can argue both ways, both have something. The only thing is, no matter which setting you pick, after a reset of the vehicle, after the next drive, everything is anyway reset on the normal recuperation. The reason is not because the manufacturer wants to tease you or taunt you, it's a mandatory reason by law because they have to make these driving cycles always in the same recuperation mode. Yeah, but that's not ideal for the customer. Mm, I think regulation-wise, this should change. Ideal temperature conditions today here for running battery electric vehicles. And then we could score some consumption figures of 20 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. That's some three miles per kilowatt hour, meaning a real road range of 450 kilometers or 280 miles. Again, that would be a little bit less than in worse conditions temperature wise, but the new standard heat pump will hopefully also even that out a little bit more. BMW iX versus BMW X5 and also the question electric or petrol. The powerful versions here, the X550 versus the M50i. These are the comparable power versions with that V8 under the hood. And of course, this electric performance. This will be so interesting, I can promise you. Let's go directly with the exterior. With the iX, here with this mono kidney, I would say. High and wide, then here not with the split and it has this automatically repairing function that when you have slight scratches, it repairs itself in harsh sunlight or with a hairdryer. This is no joke indeed. And then horizontally put lamps in the front. You can also get the BMW laser light. You can see it here with the blue accentuations and a strong lower part here as well. But the more closed look and a little bit lower for the overall experience. And here the X5, you can see a more traditional kidney here, double kidney in the front with the M50i. You also have everything you can actually get here with the shadow line, everything blacked out, so a more sinister look. Tanzanite blue is the color here, a nice and very elegant dark blue color. These here are also the laser lights, it's an option you can also equip it with here, and the more traditional daytime running light. Strong accentuations here in that M performance version in the lower part. So if you take one more comparing look here, the X5 here more traditional styling and I would say I do prefer that especially because I so much more like that double kidney whereas I'm not such a fan of that mono kidney. The iX does look more unique and people look at oh wow what is that? It catches more attention definitely but just on the styling wise in the front, it's the X X5 for me. What about you? Let's continue. Hey, that's a cool comparison shot here, is it? <laughs> in the side profile. The iX, 4 meters 95 or 195 inches. The X5, almost the same length, 194 inches or 4 meters 92. And yeah, you know, these two and a half, three centimeters or an inch is the difference also in the wheelbase. Wheelbase slightly longer here in the iX, but not really a big difference. The X5, you can see, has the more upright building form. We have 21 inch wheels, comparable 21 inch here for both vehicles, here the X5. And definitely here the more classic conservative setup. I really like the X5 styling. It is bold, it is more angular actually. And when we move over to the X, sorry, iX, <laughs> yeah, it gets X, 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 X. <laughs> Here we also have 21 inch wheels, so we can really compare the driving comfort definitely. And also here you can see then, it's just flatter, as flat as an X6 rather. 
and a rather sleek line here and it's just more stretch and a little bit less angular overall but definitely in length and wheelbase both are very comparable as for suspension for both you can either get the normal adaptive suspension or opt it up with the air suspension since it's the m50i with the x5 we have the normal adaptive suspension there in here with the air suspension but they both come very close these bmw suspension i can already tell you so far more details than soon in the driving part this will be super interesting here at the rear i still also prefer the x5 in a way because of the more traditional styling nice tail lamp design here with the led as well and i also prefer the x5 if you compare it to the x6 because this suv coupe style is yeah sometimes doubtful as for the design let's take it that way here in the lower part AFAP alert, auto food fake exhaust police because the outer tip is you know just for beauty reasons than the rear ones on the inside with that V8 here. However, the IX from the rear design, I think it's also beautifully done here with that very slim stretch. So that's to me actually pretty cool as well. As for the top speed, the IX in the X Drive 50 version is at 200 kilometers an hour or 125 miles an hour. You can go as fast as the X5. That is then 250 kilometers an hour or 155 miles an hour if you go for the m60 version of the ix that is also available top speed wise these would be then more comparable you know but power output wise and acceleration wise these here are more comparable then it's very interesting and also price wise i can already tell you so far the x5 as a base x5 starts lower at the price but here, if you pick then the comparable power output versions, they exactly cost the same money and they're both around one or 20,000 euros or dollars. That's very interesting, isn't it? four liter v8 for the bmw x5 m50i Woo! and the acceleration figure here is 4.3 seconds two mile kilometers or 62 miles an hour where it is 4.6 seconds with a closed hood for the bmw ix x drive 50 you cannot open the hood there is no frank underneath yeah that's the thing this one here the ix would be quicker than the acceleration when you again go for the m60 version and the x5 would be a little bit slower than this one here when you go for the 40i version for the six cylinder remember the six cylinder petrol engine will be way more fuel saving than this eight cylinder here so it is let's say a more clever choice and to me it also fits a little bit more to the vehicle however the v8 has of course even a greater sound which will also be a major difference in driving when we compare the petrol and the electric one as for the range very interesting when this one is here fueled up fully you can score some 700 kilometers easily you know some 450 miles however even more range just with the six cylinder here with the ix you can score something as high as 400 miles or 650 kilometers in best conditions ideal summertime more realistic is 500 kilometers or 300 miles and in winter time or with high autobahn speed then it drops a little bit you know less below and of course fueling it up this one here 35 minutes 10 to 80 percent state of charge and at a you know very good fast charger and here well two minutes at the fuel station now to the interiors and also have different key fobs this is the optional let's say computer key of course you can also get a more simple one for the x5 and this is the one for the x uh, ix i always mistake it is this yeah, it's getting complicated <laughs> now the interiors here this is the more classic conservative layout two times 12.3 inch screens also with a lot of real buttons here single button for everything at the steering wheel single button for the heated steering wheel for example so let's say more simplified bmw os7 as well and then there's this new very futuristic lounge interior for the ix and with more hashtag capacitive bs and here this 
one curved screen layout 12.3 inch on the left side 14.9 on the right side but it looks like it would be one screen however we've seen with the x7 facelift that the x5 probably will also soon get this layout with the bmw os8 operation system and also this one screen curved layout and then also the climate unit will change here at the x5 it's still manual at this point when we record the video with the soon coming x5 facelift it will also then be that the climate unit is in the screen. Let's take a detailed look. But I want to know from you, which basic layout would you prefer? This more futuristic lounge layout here with the iX or the more classic BMW layout with the X5? Tell me in the comments. Now we're getting inside the X5 here with a classic door handle and an awesome door closing sound. I love that. That's what I prefer actually. And then getting inside. So here, this rather classic layout, good and comfortable seating position. These seats here, by the way, at the moment, the animal skin equipment, but they're also available in SensorTech in different colors. And you want to go animal free. That's also what I would recommend. Steering wheel up and down, in and out, electric way. And it has this more round shape. This is however, the M steering wheel, where you have a thicker grip here in the top part. And with 189 or six foot two, still leaves a lot of headroom. There is a panoramic roof available, not with this very vehicle at this moment, but this one has the Alcantara ceiling. Yeah, more than a thousand of euros or dollars or more than a thousand euros, more than a thousand euros or dollars <laughs> extra price here for the Alcantara ceiling. Very expensive, but pretty beautiful. And now we come to a moment, you know these situations that someone tells you something and then you see something totally differently and you can't get it out of your head anymore. So this is a spoiler or warning that this moment will come right now because take a look at these seats. What do you see? What form or what kind of body position does it remind you of? You know, here with the upper area and the head restraints, no matter which of the seats. To me, I looked at that and I totally saw immediately here, like. Like someone would, you know, boom, like, you know, doesn't it totally look like this? <laughs> like when someone pulls the shoulders up? Sorry, now you will always see it. <laughs> and here over here with the X5, with a more classic setup here. I think a nice integration of the screens here. By the way, pretty cool, the carbon fiber inserts, but they cost more than a thousand euros or a thousand dollars extra. But at least then you have less high gloss piano lacquer for that. When we start the engine, by the way, we can see this one here still has the climate unit like this. And you also hear some of the V8. I do prefer as it is right here. Yeah, I'm just afraid that it does lose it. And it, we can expect that it does lose it like the X7. Then the AC unit also goes into that one here with the, with the face and so on. So I prefer the more conservative user interface. Uh, I, I can say it that way. Here in the lower part, by the way, you can start this one open, then you have an inductive charging pad. You can use it also for this computer key, then it does charge. Adaptive cup holders here, to me, they are also a little bit better than in the iX. And then, yes, a real shifting lever. This one here for the sports shifting mode, pretty cool. And the control lever here with a classic setup. You can control it while driving, for example. To me, that's the better solution. Now let's take a quick look at the screens. At this moment, BMW OS 7, and I think that's the easiest solution. Look at that, on the left side, you have all the menus you need possibly, and everything has a good overview, and I don't really need much more. You have this home screen, um, but usually I just use the one on the left side, and car can be accessed directly here. And to me, that's all I need, and then the Apple CarPlay hotkey right here a good integration like this and this one is equipped with the optional Harman Kardon sound system which has a great very true 3d surround sound yeah I just love that and the digital instruments you cannot change too much in there here right side the rpms left side the speed and up display nothing special but always nice to have rear seating here of the x5 you can see the classic setup not too much of space, although it's a long car, you can already see that. Inside, how's the seating position and headroom and so on. So it is sufficient here in like room, no problem. 
and here also headroom no problem it's yeah actually very comfortable you can easily house four adults it doesn't have a too high middle tunnel here so it's actually also okay here with five tall adults a little bit stiff on the middle seat but that works so overall i'm quite happy here with the rear area of course when you look from here to the front it's not as impressive as the ix just from the visuals from the inside these rather hidden door handles for the ix and frameless doors and that leads also to yeah a very bad door closing sound that's the catch of it so inside of the doors this is in this case animal skin uh, however you can also get it with sensitec leatherette same for the seats this is an animal skin seat but they are sensitec seats they are very beautiful also available in black and beige for example we had them and also in brown so there are enough animal free choices definitely this different lounge interior setup getting in it's a little bit lower that whole vehicle and headroom is also plenty no problem at all and there's also a panoramic roof available for this one the difference is this panoramic roof when you would have one is closed always you cannot open it you can just dim it the other one in the x5 you can also open it and yeah it is definitely a different seating position you sit overall lower not this super high command driving position but the visual effect of is of course more yeah you know evoking more impressive interior overview here for the ix super impressive definitely with that yeah unique steering wheel setup it looks cool to handle not sure not really an advantage but you get along somewhat i would say very clean definitely right here and with the latest bmw os8 then you have this flying middle console here right here this crystalline um turning lever by the way <laughs> well you can also get it in the normal base version then you have high gross biennial like that. that's the disadvantage but this one can be blinding when there's some sun rays in there here with the matte wood of course that is really cool and very clean setup here once again when you select the driving modes here that's more complicated because you have to select it here and then have to press it in the screen or select it there and then select it with the turning jog here and then it stays like this and when you want to go back to the gps you have to hit the gps button so that's to me a little bit too complicated and this is the theme here of that vehicle also here with the climate control inside here yes we know that will be expected for the x5 to me they have made the user interface more complicated that's the downside of the vehicle although it looks really awesome Oh, look at these little clouds, nice visualization. So it is quick here, so they have enough processing power, definitely. Here on the left side, you miss the car menu, and that is, to me, really hit and miss. So I want to have these car features, but then I have this all apps view, and there's apps all over the place. It's just too much. You can limit it to vehicle apps, but then where do I find what? I have no idea, and I don't want to you know have such a mess in the infotainment system or what about you so i think maybe taking it a step back the os 7 was just easier to use this is the carplay integration or android auto also possible for the ix just wireless and here we have the harman kardon sound system and i think it's once again a great sound comparable definitely maybe the resonance room here is even a little bit better in the ix hey uh, maybe it's a little bit more awesome the sound even you know there's also um, the Bowersman Wilkins system available which is even more expensive 4D but I think the Harman Kardon system is absolutely fine then the digital instruments you have the startup sounds iconic sounds by Hans Zimmer uh -huh. mm. are they really necessary not sure these here you cannot turn them off you can just turn off the sounds of the driving experience that can be turned off but not the startup sound here you can also change the contents and also the whole layout of the thing so you're a little bit more flexible with these instruments overall hmm. yeah i think they have become more complicated once again by these you can adjust it then how you like it and the ix also features a head-up display if you have some GPS guidance, you will even see more of that there. 
in the rear. They are using this EV platform, no middle tunnel whatsoever. Let's see about the legroom and headroom result right here. Yeah, this is a little bit more legroom even. Um, yeah, really using this platform as well. So that's actually quite cool. But this is actually, you know, the thing we have a little bit more in the wheelbase, a little bit more uh, there, like this, you know, couple of centimeters. So that's actually well done. Headroom wise, also no problem at all. And it's also comfortable. So it is definitely comparable as for the rear experience. Here you feel a little bit more spacious, especially when you move to the middle seat. So driving with five tall adults is seating wise more comfortable. Just the back part here to me a little bit um, harder. So that's the difference. You can get along in the rear with both vehicles. Both have a very comfortable result. Of course here, you know, more cozy open space experience. Now the trunk comparison, they open quite differently. Here the iX one hatch and the X5 has this split hatch. And the cool thing is it has some more character, I think, because you can have this picnic function in here of that lower area and just enjoy yourself or each other. <laughs> so I think it's a cool solution, definitely. I, I mean, maybe it's not always the most practical thing, but I just find it cool, you know. What about the figures? 500 liters here, 100 liters more than in the iX for the X5. A meter in length, easily a meter or 40 inches in width, a little bit more even. And now the height that is interesting is about yeah, more than 80 centimeters or 32 inches. This is a difference then, overall very well usable. Let's move over. 400 liters, 100 liters less for the iX. And what is actually the difference? So we have here the length with a little bit more than a meter, so a little bit more. Width also easily a little bit more than a meter or 40 inches. But now the height, that is more limited, more at 75 centimeters or less, yeah, about like 29 inches. So you lose a little bit of height. So it's a little bit more narrow there. And then you have a different angle here, and that's why you also lose these leader figures. Welcome to Thomas's Comparison Driving Lounge, starting with the BMW X5 in the M50i with the 4.4 liter V8. Great performance. Sports mode, that we also have some quick shifting. Well, and let's also put it to the sports shifting mode here, putting the shifting lever to the left side. And we let car pass, uh, one more, just, just for safety precautions, because we will be very, very quick. From 40 kilometers an hour, let's go. further and this is also a difference here with the combustion engine we can go 250 kilometers an hour this is the top speed right now whoa impressive super impressive indeed and how calm and stable this vehicle remains also at higher speeds not sure why this light truck is here on the left lane here also with the adaptive BMW suspension wow that lane change we have a huge SUV but there's no problem in lane changing and it stays so upright and calm and collected. That is just awesome. And that's also a thing about air suspension versus the normal BMW uh, adaptive suspension. In the X5, you can get that adaptive suspension, the adaptive M suspension with a sportier tune here in the M50i version or the adaptive air suspension. And usually the air suspension is always better as for the comfort, not necessarily as for replacing it cost-wise when it gets broken and sometimes then of course an air suspension is more expensive if you hold the car for a long, long time. But here the adaptive BMW suspension is so good actually that it's keeping the, it says keeping, keeping the lane, please Thomas. <laughs> so the adaptive suspension is so good actually that at some point with the X5 and the X7, I say you can easily go for the adaptive suspension and you don't need an air suspension. So this here, 
the big BMW adaptive suspension here in the X3, X5 and so on. The W5 series is one of my favorite adaptive suspensions overall and it is indeed so good, so so well combining sportiness and comfort that you do not miss an air suspension. So here it's absolutely fine not to big the air suspension. It's incredible how sporty the car is, although it's so big and heavy, and at the same time great comfort, although we have huge wheels mounted there. That is an extraordinary achievement indeed. And of course you can also go for an air suspension, but to me it doesn't bring you a big comfort plus here in the X5 and the X7. Again, not because the air suspension wouldn't be any good, just because the normal adaptive suspension is so great. And here in the M trim, it is combined with the stiffer note. You have the sport here, right? And especially here at higher speeds. But still, it's not that you would say, oh, I can't take this as a primary comfort car for everyday driving life or something. This is totally fine then still. So um, yeah, this is the thing about the X5 in general. It has had such great handling and to me, driving wise, my favorite full size SUVs are really the BMW X5 or the X6 if you prefer that coupe line and then the Audi Q8 or Q7 also depending, you know, if you want that coupe line or not. Um, between the Q7 and the Q8, I feel there's a bigger difference than between the X than between X5 and X6. Yeah, I'm leaning more towards either Q8 or the X5 somehow um, because the X5 has this, you know, more practical trunk. The Q8 doesn't lose much practicability and don't need the space of the Q7, so that would be, you know, my pick. Then in this case, SQ5 petrol or here the X5 with the six cylinder because here the eight cylinder it does quite go quite high in the consumption figures at least 11 liters on one kilometers if you really use it more like 14 liters on one kilometers so you either minimum um, some 20 mpg us 25 mpg uk or more realistic less than 20 mpg us more like 16 17 mpg us and barely 20 mpg uk that's a realistic consumption figure there of course the ix is way more efficient if you want to go same high speeds by the way you have to go for the m60 version with the ix but here today we picked the 50 version that's why the manufacturers do that with these strange numbers nowadays that you can indeed also power wise compare the electric versions and the combustion engine versions and these are the ones actually power wise comparable and in general well how is the felt difference of course soon we'll drive the ix and we, we can tell you more about that but i've driven the ix in so many different versions so far and the thing is both feel kind of heavy at the same time they really very well combine sportiness and comfort you do feel that the ix has a lower center of gravity that helps in sportier driving and also feels more settled on the road just in very tight corners where you're hard on the brakes and the vehicle is being pushed outwards the ix does have some added weight yeah, but then again the center of gravity is lower mm. so i'm really looking forward soon you know we'll do one more auto one acceleration i'll also already put it in the sport shifting mode so then the gears are turned up later we will have some winding, no, that truck will not go in front of me again. <laughs> so um, later on, we will have small, tight winding corners, and this will be very interesting. So and there's a bully behind me now, although I'm driving the speed that is allowed. But now I say goodbye. Yes, I could be a German Bond villain, definitely, definitely. I'm free to do that, you know, for any directors watching. <laughs> ah, more than 200 kilometers an hour, 125 miles an hour, and it feels so sporty. No overtaking a uh, BMW Z4, and we're saying like, what the hell, I'm supposed to have the sports car? No, I have the sports car, you have the moment, <laughs> it feels like that. Wow, amazing sporty performance, feels so great, and noise insulation wise, 
awesome. I mean, over 200 kilometers an hour, more than 125 miles an hour, feels like nothing. It almost feels like standing still. It's not too loud in here. The car feels so smooth. This is a great piece of engineering indeed. And yeah. Hello, Mr. Bond. Welcome to my realm. You will now die from the sharks in the pond. <laughs> okay. So far, as for the Bond villain thing, again, my application is standing. Now we're heading into some countryside roads. And also, the. Oh, this is so great. I mean, I'm just having so much fun. Yeah, the traffic light is still green. Now, 90 degree corner. Oh, awesomeness. Wow. This was, by the way, a stop sign indicator. Of course, at this point, the stop sign was irre irrelevant because there was the green traffic light. If you wonder, in Germany, a stop sign and green traffic light means that if the traffic light at some point would fail or if it's maybe turned off in nighttime, then the stop sign counts. But as long as, tra as uh, there's a traffic light, all this traffic light is counting. Wow. Cruise control. You can set it here on this assisted driving mode as well. And then, let's see, yeah, assisted driving, and then we can also, uh, yeah, here we go. And there's the green steering symbol, and let's see how smooth that is. See here, no hectic steering movement, but rather very, very smooth. That works well. Yeah, assistance systems wise, let's see that corner. Yeah, look at that, even in that rather tight corner, it's meant to do autobahn assisted driving, you know, but even here it was doing that very, very well. So the thing is, I'm getting along so well with that vehicle here. I know the operation system, 7.0 system, and it's to me a little bit simpler than in the iX. However, we have to remember that the X5 will get that, <laughs> will get that update here that we know from the X7 face it will be the same. And then also infotainment and screens wise, there won't be a big difference anymore between iX and X5, depending on if you watch this review at a later stage or if you watch it when it's you know, really, really fresh or maybe think about getting a used one or so. I'm a little bit more confident with the more traditional conservative design. Also, when I have here the climate unit to control manually, again, this will change at some point then. But the big question is really then X5 or iX. And at this point, you know, when we start driving with the X5, it's really hard to pick any other SUV to that. Um, as I said, I really like the Q8. It's also so much fun in driving. That would be definitely a harsh, you know, a hard, hard pick or a hard thing to do, really. Yeah, by the way, yeah, going back to normal shifting, but we can also go to comfort mode. We have a more balanced setting. Gears are not turned that high than here in the comfort shifting mode and also normal comfort mode. The suspension is a little bit more forgiving and so on. So uh, rather smooth ride. Mm. I mean, size-wise, X5 and iX are somewhat similar, definitely. The wheelbase also doesn't differ that much. I told you earlier, just a couple of centimeters, the iX has more in wheelbase. So they have some similarities. You do feel that the X5 is higher here on the inside and also on the outside. Remember that the iX has the length of an X5, the height of an X6 and the wheels of an X7. So the X5 feels more traditional SUV definitely. Actually the iX more feels a little bit than, than the X6 I would say in a way. Uh, although, although it doesn't really have that coupe shape, um, yeah, yeah, it's really, really, really tough to say. But um, you definitely have a more traditional conservative layout here with the X5. Um, I would say, especially when you're used to so far BMWs, of course, you get along a little bit better. I feel also that the steering wheel is better to handle. The iX steering wheel is more freakish, as it's very, very, how could you say, even modern design, it's more like um, 
experimental design with the iX. And this to me handles a little bit better, definitely. Uh, from the overview, the X5 is also better as for this more you know, upright uh, form from the windows and so on. And, um, hmm. yeah. I mean, we, we soon reach now these winding corners part. This will be a very, very important test, maybe even the important test. Not that everyone would do winding corners with these cars all the time. But there we can find out more about the individual characteristics. But I can already tell you so far, after driving both, yeah, the choice is getting harder and harder and harder. What will I do? But first of all, let's hit the corners. One more time to the sports mode and to the sports shifting mode. Yeah, that V8 does make a difference sound-wise. So if you ask yourself, is it better with the V8 sound than with the electric boost sound? Yeah, of course it is. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Nice. We have also the rear exit steering here that helps when parking in and out, but also getting out of the corners. And let's see and remember also how much it pushes to the outside of the corners. Oh, for such a heavy SUV, hardly. And nice acceleration out. Rear axle bias, of course, or rear bias for the all wheel drive. Oh, it drives so extremely well. Yeah, I can just underpin that. And of course, the V8 sound is great. Still, for efficiency reasons, in this case, I would still go for the six cylinder in the X5 and yeah, like the 40i. And this will also be absolutely fine power wise, definitely. But now the question is how does the iX relate to this here? And now to the BMW iX sport mode, and I also go from 40 kilometers an hour to the German Autobahn. Let's go. Plop, 200 kilometers an hour, 125 miles an hour. That's also the top speed in here for the X-Drive 50 version. Faster, also 250 kilometers an hour would also go with the M60 version. And here also at high speeds, good noise insulation, very stable on the, low, on the road, low center of gravity, nice lane changing. You feel that the car is a little bit lower and the center of gravity is lower, that's also helpful. As for wind noise, the thing is, yeah, also great result overall. Um, because you don't have the engine sound, you might sub Objectively think it's louder, especially here from that area and also when you have some cars passing by, but it is also a super, super silent ride. It is really tough to say which one is exactly more silent. Both are very silent. I feel just that the difference that the, you know, subjective note that maybe the X5 would be more silent, I think it rather comes from that the engine in the X5 covers some of the smaller wind noise that would come, you know, some from here like this, a car passes by and you hear that a little bit more prominently when there's no engine running. So that's, I think, the, the main difference. Yeah, I'm getting off of the motorway now here. The thing is really, the user interface in the X5 is to me definitely better, less complicated than this one here. Sadly, and I said the X5 will get the same updates and then will be like in the X7 or you know, similar co or comparable to this one here. So user interface wise, I would rather say get the X5 now, <laughs> but you still have the, uh, like this, this easier user interface, you know, that would to me be the, the cooler thing, definitely. I want a silent yet sporty and performance experience. Energy consumption wise, you can score here in summertime great results with the iX. Some 17 kilometers on one kilo 17 kilowatt hours on one kilometers or 27 kilowatt hours on 100 miles. And that would rather mean a range of 650 kilometers or 400 miles. A more realistic figure if you have some more, um, let's say, you know, a little bit more performance driving, more higher speed autobahn, 
you can still easy score 500 kilometers or 300 miles just in very very cold winter time um, that might drop down you know so uh, and even high speed driving we once tested that we can drive this one here at 200 kilometers an hour for 200 kilometers so 125 miles an hour for 125 miles yeah that's it so if you compare to the eight cylinder then actually the range difference in summertime is not that big with the eight cylinder we had around like 700 kilometers of range here then 650 maximum but the more it goes on motorway and the higher the speed is and the colder the temperatures are or the lower the temperatures are the more range difference is there and of course if you compare the six cylinder in the bmw x5 then you still have a significant range difference especially in winter times but range wise here because they stepped up the game here at bmw i think the result is when you think about ev versus petrol it's not really about the range it is and recharging is also good you know with the 35 minutes 10 to 80 percent state of charge here the question is how is your charging infrastructure at home at work underway how is it on your travel routes how is it on your regular drives every day and how is your infrastructure where you usually charge or where you usually can charge and also you know from like sustainability environmental aspect definitely when you pick the x5 get the six cylinder that is from the combustion engine point the best choice and you can easily go electric to me i think really it's all about the infrastructure that's to me the most crucial point because the driving experience in the electric vehicle is awesome yes the sound is somewhat missing and i mean in these uh you know in these driving modes here um and because you also have uh, this you know this this enhanced sound if if you want it uh, that way um it is somewhat interesting definitely um you can also activate or deactivate it but here again you see how complicated it is like where is that now you know so i have seen it before but then again you search for such a long time where is that now you know so uh, and for some time for some things even if you have seen them already you think like where is that now you know and i don't know so i can't find it instantly now and that's really the thing is it live vehicle i i have no idea so and then you don't find things and then you say whatever you want to say yeah whatever you know so here in the sports mode once again when we start at 100 kilometers an hour let's accelerate and 200 once again it, it's starts slowing down a little bit earlier and here great handling at high speeds it's a lot of fun as well oh now hard on the brakes yeah that happens also that they overtake even though they don't have enough speed so once again on the gas such great acceleration and here now this is a typical situation here is now we're finished at 200 kilometers an hour and now i could use a little bit more speed to overtake this one yeah but i mean that's totally a german thing to say or to do now once again hard on the brakes and here of course when we were at high speeds we can gain back the energy whereas that's not possible with the combustion engine as for recuperation either normal d mode rolling and then adaptive recuperation that means when the car is in front of us then there's recuperation happening when there's no one in front of us the car is just rolling or put the shift lever to the back b mode and then i lift the foot off the throttle and we have harsh recuperation that is in more the one pedal driving feeling and which one is more suitable to you find out and also find out together with your passengers because when you drive one pedal driving then you have to be very gentle with the throttle both ways pressing it and also releasing it that you don't put extra g-forces then on your passenger the steering form is more likable in the more classic conservative layout i feel so it looks fancy here 
it's not bad to control at all. The steering feel is also good. I think just a classic round setup or let's say a, a, a setup with a just flat bottom, but then this asymmetric form, again, you get used to it and it's pretty nice, definitely. But the more classic setup is to me a little bit better, user interface wise as well. However, here, due to this open setup, you have an increased traveling feeling, but you sit lower in the X5. You have more this command driving position where here you have more or less a crossover driving position just in relation to the X5. In relation to other vehicles, this is still the pure SUV feeling, definitely. Uh, but now in direct comparison, you feel a little bit higher in the X5, definitely. So that would maybe also be a thing to consider. Which one is giving you more emotions? Yeah, I mean, the combustion engine sound, it's not only the sound, but also the vibrations, these low frequency sounds and vibrations that somehow give you a satisfying feeling. And that is missing with the electric vehicles. And I wonder, why can't they do that here? I mean, they do have the sound design, so why can't it be possible to introduce a low frequency sound? Why do they all have to sound like spaceships, you know? Yes, we got it. You want to be modern and you want to be futuristic and stuff. But can't you give the choice, you know? Why are you ordering Hans Zimmer and giving him millions for designing... <laughs> what is this for, you know? So why wouldn't you just pick, let the customer pick, hey, today I want the six cylinder, today I want the eight cylinder sound, today I want Star Trek spaceship sound, today I want, okay, whatever, Hans Zimmer sound, whatever. But, you know, let the customer pick, and then we can maybe also have that combustion engine experience without having fumes at the back. That would be something, wouldn't it? Now it will be very interesting to, gesture control, now it will be very interesting to see how does this one perform in these fast winding corners. All right, one more time, sports mode, and let's see the IX here in these winding corners. Wow, that, oh, that instant EV acceleration from the get-go is impressive and definitely harsher, sportier than in the X5, acceleration-wise. Out of the corners also very well out of it, very nice. However, I feel it pushes you a little bit more into the corner then. Wow, that rear axle steering is awesome. So accelerating out and how smooth the acceleration is, that is amazing. It does apply more G-force on your body. So the experience, I would say, is more extreme in the iX. And also how linear then this power output is when you get out of the corner. That is actually even better and sportier. I would say the X5 has, in a way, the more emotional experience because of the sound. It also feels more natural, more connected to you, whereas the iX is the more extreme experience in the sporty agility sense and more feels like in a computer game, you know, because the power is so enormous, especially from the get-go. So, yeah, I would say the iX then, from the figures, from the performance, actually more impressive, especially in the lower speed areas. But the X5 delivers a more natural experience. Because you have no shifting here, and the power is immediately there, this one here is in a way more seamless, you know, without any transitions and so on. <sighs> but just if you think about the fun way, mm, ah, this is so tough, you know. Here, lower center of gravity and a little bit more weight. Both are so great to ride. Um, so head-wise, you might think, yeah, it does in a way make more sense with the iX. But how the G-forces are applied and how everything comes together as an experience for sport and fun driving, for agile driving, just, you know, from a gut feeling, I would still go with the X5. Not necessarily with the M50i and the V8. I said it earlier, 
I would be totally fine with the six cylinder. This is a more natural choice for the X5, I think. So just by the driving experience, both are awesome, definitely. But from, from the gut feeling, I would still go with the X5 um, than with the, you know, like a, like a 40i. And I can't really explain why, or I can't like, you know, yeah, maybe something with the sound and so on, but that the G-Force may, may be a little bit less extreme, that might be something, but it's really a gut decision. You know, and Thomas B is already waiting for me. Now we carry on with our comparison test here and what is my final verdict for today? Well, which one will I take home now? And which one would you take home? Tell me in the comments. As for me, both are very impressive, great driving experience with both vehicles. It's amazing how agile and how sporty they can be, although the weight and the size is so enormous. That's the key to both of these vehicles, definitely. Exterior-wise, a clear winner for me, it is the X5. Interior-wise, from the looks, the, just the visuals, the iX wins it because it's so impressive, this lounge interior. User interface, however, the X5 is my winner on the interior so far, as long as they didn't facelift it the same way they do from the X7. And we can expect, if you watch this video at a later stage, probably we only get the X5 facelift or you have to buy the X5 then in a used way. How well usable it is? Well, a lot of space for both vehicles. The X5 a little bit larger as for the trunk area. Driving wise, so much fun with both vehicles. Performance wise and how extreme it is. The iX is even a little bit better, especially because you have this electric punch from the low speed areas. The more natural driving experience, definitely with the combustion engine, will, will be the same with the six in or here with the V8. So you just have a little bit more feeling for the car with the combustion engine, a little bit more emotional. And you know, maybe also vibration wise, just the gut feeling that I feel a little bit more connected when I have the X5 with the six cylinder or with the eight cylinder. I would always go for the six cylinder, it's way more fuel saving indeed, and just fits to the vehicle a little bit better. Adaptive suspension or air suspension, both do a great job. You can also stick with the normal adaptive suspension by BMW that also counts for both vehicles actually. So both great in comfort and agility at the same time. Yeah, but then the question also petrol versus electric. Um, you know, going for the electric vehicle makes sense in a way of helping, you know, that we do the shift away from petroleum use on long term. That definitely makes sense. To me, the key is, do you already have the charging infrastructure at home or and or at work? Then the iX definitely makes sense. And of course, from a sustainability aspect, when it also comes from renewable energy, this, you know, this energy. If you cannot charge at home, then of course it still makes sense in a way to go for the combustion engine. And just from an emotional aspect, from the gut feeling, I would still end up with the X5, then as the 40i six cylinder. If I take more the sustainability and moving away from petroleum mindset, then of course I would more go to the iX, but I would redo that when I have the possibility to charge at home. So these are my two cents for today, would like to hear your opinion. Now, what is your take? Petrol, electric, X5 or iX, or are you really undecided? Looking forward to your comments. The BMW X5 facelift, what have they done on exterior and interior? Different colors, different trims, different engines, all of that. Here on Autogefühl with Thomas in 4K, full screen, full length, let's go. Most obvious change in the front, the lamps. They have this arrow design now in the daytime running light. These are also the base LED lamps. Option, you can also get adaptive LED lamps. They have then blue accentuations at the side and they also replace the laser light because BMW says they have basically now the same performance technology wise. And also the problem was all that the laser light was also restricted in the US for the regulations for the high beam range. Talking about illumination, the front kidney here, the outer frame is the same, but now you can optionally get the iconic glow. That one then is the illumination of the double kidney from the inside when the main headlamp unit is on. 
And also here, this is the X line with a bright frame. Also in the lower part, the X line now is always standard. So let's say a little bit more standard equipment. If you want a darker or sportier look, then you would go for the M Sport package. And here in the lower part, you can also see a more rectangular look for all X5 models with this element here and also how it's formed right here. And another new special lighting feature is, look at here, the turning indicators or the hazard lights. They not only go like tick tack, tick tack, tick tack, but have this pulsing effect like a heartbeat with this dissolving function. Always here replacing the daytime running lights. The length 4 meters 94 or 194 inches. Base X line here for the X5 means we have the chrome frames around the windows more classic stylish look and then wheels from 19 to 22 inch these here are the 21 inch wheels the plug-in hybrid has a special design feature here at the side you usually also get these crossover wheel arches and in the m sport package they would be in vehicle color and then also with the shadow line in the m sport package you get the blacked out frames around the windows and you can also get black wheel caps and so on for a more sinister look if you like as for suspension you start with adaptive suspension in the m sport pack or the m60i you get the adaptive m suspension so a sport a stiffer setup and then optional the air suspension or if you have this plug-in hybrid here then the air suspension is standard very beautiful by the way that you also see the light signature from the side profile both from the front and also here the small design element in the rear. You can also get a rear axle steering by the way so then the rear wheels turn in the opposite direction than the front wheels giving you a better turning circle and so on. Here this new facelift design for the rear changed tail lamps and you can see here left and right they form an X. Very interesting and also when you look at them individually a more sculptural style so to speak. When you hit the turning indicators, then you also have this pulse effect here also for the rear lens. On the left side, by the way, you can see a little bit of the turning indicator. This here just as a pre-production model will of course be gone here for the customer vehicles. This one being the plug-in hybrid and the X-Line. X-Line baseline means also this contrasting part in the lower part. You always have that with every model from standard. In the M Sport package, you will then get a sportier look and here, Mm, is this a case for the other group of fake exhaust police? Vote in the comments. Here our Nardo Grey vehicle, very interesting. Also you can see the daytime running light here in the facelift. Then M Sport Bucket Pro means the dark frame around the double kidney and shiny on the inside. And then we have here in the lower part the performance parts with some additional carbon fiber. Is it over the top or not? Vote in the comments. And here you can also see that these air breathers at the sides have a real function. Here you can see the air does go through. And here in the side profile, we can see in the M Sport Pack, you have the wheel arches in the color of the vehicle color. It's actually a very elegant solution, definitely. Here with the 22 inch wheels, the biggest ones that are available. And then M Sport Packet also adds here the black frames around the windows. It's always that the M Sport Pack is combined with the high gloss shadow line and the M Sport Packet Pro is the extended shadow line with even more black accentuations like we've seen with the front double kidney. That's the new logic there. And here, by the way, this is the place where all the car deliveries take place in BMW Welt in Munich. So when you catch your vehicle right here, you can basically take a first spin here on the inside of this huge building. And yeah, you also see already some amazing cars waiting for the customers in the background. And here you can see the neighborhood of our shooting location. This is the famous BMW four cylinder and of course located in Munich next to the BMW Museum, which is this building. Car key, slim and light, and the key fob with M colors. You also get the M Sport package then. And the door closing sound, super solid, lovely sound. Also very nice here from the gaps, the so-called Spaltmasse in German. Listen and repeat, Spaltmasse. Inside of the door, also with the bright styling available, pretty cool. And then you already see right here, this will receive a curved screen now behind that steering wheel. Zoom more deals to that. Here the seats already a couple of months before the facelift. Standard is now sensor fin. That's a new material here. It's animal free. A further development of sensor tech. And you look at that. Has a perforation 
looks really high quality and also is tested for long-term durability. And you can see the new sensor fin seats are also available in black if you prefer more subtle or darker styling. Same structure, same ergonomics, just the darker color also looks cool. So on a factual side, you avoid 85% of CO2e emissions by ditching animal skin from the interior. And here, there's no disadvantage at all. They are really breathable, they have the perforation. You can also get them in combination with seat ventilation additionally. And they are super comfortable, very soft material. And as I said, they have these testing facilities here in Munich also where they test on the very same durability than other more traditional seat materials. And yeah, it's a very good seating comfort, upright seating position, command driving in the X5. And you also have enough headroom with 189 or 6 for 2. This one here equipped with the panoramic roof. You can also open it and it has this nice illumination also. Driver POV, this is the normal steering wheel, so not the M Sport steering wheel. And on the sides each, you still have real buttons. So here on the right side, also still for the volume control. And then there's this new curved screen, left side 12.3, right side 14.9. Let's take a closer look. Also the screen quality looks fancy, but then, wait a minute, where's the AC unit? Yeah, like in the BMW X7 here. It goes now into the screen. Here, this is how you control the AC unit now, at least it's always staying in the same place. In the infotainment system, I really like this 3D view here with the Blue Ridge Mountain color. Blue Ridge Mountain, three-dimensional view. <laughs> so here, you can actually zoom in that one. Look at that. Here also with the new headlights. Wow, this is also a great resolution. Hmm, I think the kids will do that all day, right? <laughs> then, let's take a look at this, the main menu. You can also have this main menu, but you really have to search for yourself which apps do you really need because it might be a little bit overload. However, then the Apple CarPlay integration, quicker and more reliable also in this wireless way. Same goes to Android Auto. And here, by the way, we have the Harman Kardon system, the sound system, and I also like the sound. I think it always fits to the BMWs. The Harman Kardon sound system are, let's say, bass intensive, so are really good for electronic music, I find. Oh, by the way, here it even shows when you activate the turning indicators. Nice. And what about the voice control? Hey, BMW, drive me to Munich. I am in Munich, obviously. Just a moment. And let's see what it's doing. The results for you. Yeah, that's I working. <laughs> in the digital instruments, you can see the car internal map, but when I activate Apple Maps in CarPlay, you see it immediately switches then to this map view, also full screen, really cool indeed. This is now possible with BMW OS 8. You can also have different content in there. Of course, this map view is really useful with Google Maps. It works with Android Auto, but only these two combinations. So Android Auto, Google Maps, and Apple CarPlay, Apple Maps. And for the head-up display, you can also switch through different views. Yeah, people watching all the fancy BMW cars here at BMW Welt in Munich. New illuminated panel right here, X5, and it also changes then in the ambient lighting. Here we go. It looks quite fancy, doesn't it? However, we still have a manual volume jog. You look at this detail, nice mesh structure in this middle part of the front dashboard. And it is also featuring this new air vent control. That way you close or open it and then it has this kind of floating control. This is here today a real wood decor. You can get different decor elements and underneath you can see here also illumination. You can also get here these heated, oh, and cooled cup holders. This is heating, of course, the blue is the cooling. And I would have wished that the inductive charging pad is now ventilated like in new BMW models, but they didn't do that. Really nice, by the way, how the ambient lighting is continued here in the middle console. I like that I'm still able here to use this iDrive controller to control the infotainment system. And this is also an optional package here with a crystalline look both here for the shifting lever and also for the iDrive controller. You can see it here on the inside details. And if you ask yourself, does that blind you sometimes? This is your answer. 
rear seating also great comfort for rear passengers also enough headroom with my size at least nice panoramic roof legroom it works for four and five tall adults that's no problem actually but not abundance of space actually and you cannot adjust the rear back part as for the angle in this vehicle here this is by the way for rear seat entertainment that you can have an ipad holder attached or something the middle seating here is quite okay it's spacious enough just a little bit harder and once again the build quality of the seat material here is superb indeed the x5 gets this typical split opening and i always call it picnic hatch because it's a really cool function maybe like on a summer road trip when you sit down here and yeah just next to each other and enjoy the sunset or whatever and the width here is pretty impressive it's actually more than a meter one meters ten or 44 inches pretty usable the length here a little bit less than a meter or 40 inches the usual capacity is 650 liters here the plug-in hybrid gets only 500 liters but that's not because it's different in height the height here is actually very good for the x5 and that is here at about 76 centimeters or 30 inches it's just that below we have a little bit less space but still some space for a charging cable one thing that is missing now since a couple of months even before the facelift you cannot fold the seats from here you have to grab over them like this or go around then they fold flat very nicely however it has been to do with some supply chain problems we know this topic but then they didn't find another new supplier and then say like ah okay we just cancel this option I think that's a little bit lazy for a car that is so high in the price. And the total length you get then is here about 1 meter 70 or 68 inches. And here we have now a vehicle, different interior with an M Performance part steering wheel, Alcantara left and right, looks cool and also better grip. Engines 40i, the pure petrol engine, 3 liter inline six cylinder, 5.4 seconds is the acceleration figure, 380 horsepower. The 50e, the plug in hybrid, we had this one with the Blue Ridge Mountain vehicle. That one is a little bit quicker actually, less than five seconds in the acceleration, 26 kilowatt hours battery for the capacity, and you can go more than 100 kilometers or 60 miles pure electric with that one. Then also a 3 in inline 6 in diesel is available. And then there is the M60i model, same for the X5. And also here, for example, for an X6, then you also have a special new front double kidney in the former M competition style. That one then at 4.3 seconds in the acceleration figure from that 4.4 liter V8, or with even quicker acceleration at 625 horsepower in the true M model. So what do you think about these facelift changes? Let's discuss in the comments. Yeah, we lose the manual AC control, but we gain a newer tech software-wise and also this more modern screen and so on. So it's definitely pro and con, but I think overall the facelift works very well. Visually, I think exterior, pre-facelift and post-facelift, they both actually look good and it's definitely one the top vehicles here in this segment. This here is the Genesis GV70 mid-size premium SUV from Hyundai's premium brand. Well, can it be one of the best mid-size SUVs overall? Let's find out. Thomas and Auto Fuel, let's go. Once again, a very strong design by Genesis here in the front. This one is the sport line with black accentuations in the lower part and also a darker frame around the grille. We'll also soon compare the luxury line and this matte paint here is called Melbourne Grey Matte. So greetings to all our Aussies down under. And the LED lamps, slim integrated here, modern daytime running light. I think design-wise already very well done in the front. And here we have the other color for you, a white vehicle, of course, more color choice available. And this one is also the luxury line. That means more chrome accentuations here upper and lower part. The length is at 4 meters 72 or 186 inches and these here are 19 inch wheels minimum. Maximum goes up to 21 inch wheels. We'll soon check it out with the other car. Once again, cool styling here for the matte paint. ECS, electronically controlled suspension is standard. So these are the adaptive dampers. An interesting design clue is right here at the C pillar, kind of standing upright. More reminds me of a Mercedes GLE, doesn't it? And then we have this separated window here in the rear. And clearly when you go for a white color, this third window there in the rear becomes just more obvious. 
But it looks a little bit weird, doesn't it? And there it is, the wide vehicle, which kind of looks completely different than the darker one from the side profile. Don't you think so as well? And here then the 21 inch wheels, really massive here for that midsize SUV segment. And in any case, wheel arches painted in vehicle color. The luxury line here in the rear, definitely a sport look and really modern here with the flat integration of the rear lamps. How it looks like down there, yes, we have chromium in the luxury line, but this is also more about which engine do you have. This one here equipped with a diesel and there is no exhaust pipe whatsoever. It's just really the rear one underneath, but I think that brings a really clean design. Design here for the sport line and petrol engine. You can see here this part, you know, is a little bit more accentuated than with this, you know, checkered structure and then well, outer fuel effect exhaust alloy is present right here because the real exhaust on the inside, the outer tips are fake. Well, the air does go through, but still a case for the outer fuel effect exhaust police. Otherwise, you know, the real design is really cool, I think. By the way, some more colors. This one here is called burgundy, so a very, very dark red. Oh, and what about the strong red one? They really have a nice red exterior color, don't they? And turning indicators, we know it from Genesis already, they're really, really cool, both hazard lights and turning indicators with this double LED scheme here in the two stripes. That doesn't count for the GV70 in the rear here though, because they are then placed in the lower part. Well, it has a reason. Because when you open that hatch, then they would otherwise disappear. Well, 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 but the German eye discovered this one here, the Spaltmaße, the panel gaps, and look at that here. Not really happy with, you know, how the hood is being bent here in the front, so this is kind of like too big the gap. And then also, secondary part, what is this here? You know, this overlapping hoop, hood here in the front, not sure why they did that in this exact kind of way. Hmm. Luxury line interior, here it becomes obvious why you should go for the sport line in this case if we decide between these two look at that steering wheel we know it from the bigger models it just looks yeah too traditional too old school i think here and also with animal skin seats there in the base model you can get a beige or black leatherette so they cover this one definitely but it will be even more interesting in the sport line to come and there we go this steering wheel looks way more likable sport design Somewhat similar as we know from the G70. However, there's one big change here. There are still real buttons in the scene. We're glad we have them. But then also some capacitive buttons, but at least it's not all capacitive. So they found still a good mix. And then this would be the other alternative to the pure leatherette seats that are available. These ones here on the sport line. A mix of fabric right here and then leatherette right there. So according to the information, also animal free. And they are more breathable than, of course, if there's a fabric share. So these are then indeed also seats to go for. Pretty cool. But let's not forget the car key. Also here with this remote parking function, by the way, soon more to that. And then the door closing sound. Yeah, quite nice. But yeah, beep, 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 beep. Uh -huh. Instead of the doors here, soft touch. Good look, also contrast hitches, and also nice quality here from the buttons and so on. So this looks all really good and also how everything is processed and also the, you know, all the panel gaps here on the inside, really superb. Yeah. When I shut down the ignition, steam wheel comes up, seat moves backward. When I activate the ignition, steam wheel comes down, seat comes forward, and yeah, of course the yeah, quite obvious beep, 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 something. <laughs> we know it. Um, yeah, it's actually a very nice seating position. You have a lot of room around you and you don't feel like the huge difference to the bigger GV80. So this one here already feels quite sophisticated. I've also driven the G70, the sedan, the, you know, sister model to this one here. And I found that the difference G70 to G80 is way larger than here GV70 to GV80. Quite interesting, isn't it? So good seating position, nice fabric seats, breathable. One means a six, six with one, enough space left. So, so far, good. Here the interior overview. You can see a very clean design, especially here then. Another red dashboard. And then this 14.5 inch widescreen taken from a G80 or a GV80. So this is a major difference also if you compare the sedan brother, the G70 here to the GV70 SUV, 
where the sedan gets the smaller screen and here also some more updates there. this is here this area more modern looks really cool design and i really glad they kept the temperature dials here in a manual way just the vent strength has to be controlled by the screen but yeah i can live with that as long as this one here is still there so this is kind of like a mix of traditional and modern i would say and you still have hard hotkeys here for example to access the map there's also a very interesting screensaver here, of course, and you also have a lower home button to access the main menu there again. Again, the steering wheel, perforated at the sides, and then you can still also have these hard keys here, capacitive button to activate the cruise control, for example. Soon also to these three-dimensional instruments a little bit more, head-up display is available. And here in the lower part, yeah, we can see here, it's an interesting cubby hole, but for the smartphone, but goes really deep in there so you really have to bury out your smartphone there always and this is also a very interesting part right here because you remember in the gv80 or in the g80 this one here is a this one is completely shallow you can only do like da, 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 the dj and now they switched it to a real knob here you can actually like use like this and this is way more practical so much easier to cruise through the menu it was said before that maybe you can mistake then the shifting lever here they are shifting it's not a shifting lever it's shifting knob with that one but i think no um, because this one is just so much more here and you just use it once or twice and this one then is also a little bit higher and it feels differently um, so i don't think that i would mistake this one for that one would you Cup holders are also adaptive, nicely done. And we have this middle armrest, could be a little bit better attached underneath, more space. And the digital instruments have a 3D effect, but you cannot see that on camera just with your own eyes. And then the middle contents can be changed. And then we have a head up display, useful option. And yeah, these guys are cleaning a Thomas Blue Genesis G70. Check out that review as well. And by the way, another proof of quality or how these gaps or how these contrast stitches are very well aligned. And then this infotainment system, once again, so much easier to control now from below and so much quicker. Again, the great screensaver, like where you have the transition to the map. However, the software itself, yeah, I mean, it's okay. And also better than past ones. Still, you know, with this kind of hook thingy for the pinch and zoom, I don't know what they're thinking, why they are not finally removing that. Um, yeah, and then for example here, seat controls, you have some detailed settings right there if you don't want to do them by the seat themselves. There's a terrain mode available even, you know, yeah, but at the moment it's off, but nice visualizations here for the vehicle. You can also start the car and show you more about that. Here we go, then you have even better visualization for that, and we also have these degree angles and so on. And then the CarPlay integration looks like this. And you still have a map then on the right part because it's so much widescreen actually. And let's listen to that it's sound system. Yeah, very clear. In the rear, there's also this leather red cover for the rear door here as well. And then there's also an advantage if you compare now the G70 sedan. Here you have more legroom because you sit more upright. This exactly fits then. Also headroom wise, no problem. There's a nice hanger here also for your jackets. However, if you compare it to other SUVs in this segment, it's not the most, you know, no, 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 not the most plentiful legroom here there is, but it's actually okay. Then the back part of the seat can be adjusted more upright or more to the back. Oh, like really like a sleepy position. Goodbye. <laughs> so that goes really far. There is a huge middle tunnel here, however. So moving in the back here is yeah, quite complicated. In the middle part, you sit quite upright. Also gets close with the knees. So rather four tall adults and the fifth tall adult is maybe like just for short term. Nice rear climate unit here as well. And also two USB USB eight chargers actually. And then in the middle part, we have cup holders. They are not adaptive though. Trunk opens here like in the Porsche Macan and 540 up to 1680 liters. That's not too much actually because it's not that high. However, you have an even loading still. The length here of the trunk is 96 centimeters or about 37 inches and the total height right here 28 inches or 72 centimeters the width between the wheel arches it's very interesting 
yeah, is definitely a good meter of 40 inches. And you can see here, backpack also fits here and well, underneath the cover. The thing is, you know, when it fits like this, it's being kept tight, but this like, you know, a little bit wobbly. That's the, you know, disadvantage to that. But then you can keep things tight with that. So there's pro and con to that, definitely. But even more interesting is, of course, when we take it out completely. And there's something which is, you know, created in a very nice solution here because here in the front, first of all, listen to that carefully, click. So this one is kind of secured with a click, but when it's open, you can remove the side pads here and then there's actually really space to store that rear cover. So here we go, change it now, see, works. And then we can fold the seats from here. That's also quite practical. One third, two thirds split and indeed folds very directly. And when we then measure the length to the driving seats, it's, yeah, it's almost 180 in meters. That means yeah, some 70 inches overall well usable. And one of my favorite features when you approach the vehicle, this functionality was introduced with the previous generation Hyundai Tucson here. You just wait a little bit, it beeps, and then it automatically opens without you needing to make a foot kick or something. And it's really practical when you have heavy items in your hand and opens quite yeah, fairly wide. I can stand underneath it with one way A6 or 6 of 1 and child safety test. Let's see. Yeah, also proven. And of course, beep, beep, beep. <laughs> And now to that remote parking function. So even if the car is already closed, you always have to hit the close button again. And then directly after that, the right one in the top, then you maybe heard it, the car has started. And then let's just imagine it's like in a very tight parking spot. You can move it actually with the key. Okay, there we go. I had to be a little bit closer to the vehicle. And now it's rolling forward. See here, when I'm, when I'm getting too far away, it automatically stops, so I have to be closer. Come on, here we go. Come on, buddy. Yes, good boy, good boy. And not goodbye. Uh, yeah, good boy, from, from good boy to goodbye now. <laughs> also works here, reverse, by the way. The GV70 gets the more modern engines than the sedan brother, the G70, here with more displacement. So that's an interesting trend. 2.5 liter four cylinder turbo engine with 250 or 300 horsepower in this spec, then here, 6.1 seconds in the acceleration, or the 3.5 liter V6, then with 380 horsepower and 5.1 seconds, so a second faster. And then there's also a 2.2 liter diesel. Oh, look at that. These firefighters having a great time with their vintage vehicle. <laughs> Obviously taking some photo. So let's go here. Thomas's driving lounge with the Genesis GV70. This will be very interesting. Why? First of all, first time for me in this vehicle. Then how is it rating against Mercedes GLC, Audi Q5, BMW X3, for example, and how does it rate against the bigger Genesis GV80 SUV and also comparing it to the G70 sedan, the platform brother. So actually then three different, very interesting aspects. And of course, overall, how good is it, you know, in this segment? And first I have to say, exterior wise, great styling. Interior wise, good build quality. And also the user interface is still somewhat classic in a way that we can easily access a lot of the functions. And now driving wise, yeah. The platform itself feels quite agile and light. There's a big difference, the GV80 definitely. But the thing is that from the interior, you know, from the perceived interior space, it doesn't feel so much smaller. This is a very interesting key finding for me here already. So when I compared really the G70 versus the G80, so mid-size sedan versus their big sedan, huge difference already from the interior and also driving wise, huge difference. But here then the differences GV70 versus GV80 
are not that large as you would might expect. And this one here also has a lot of modern features and of course has the same infotainment system for example. This one has the more modern engines, the bigger engines, the more powerful engines. And yeah, in a way, of course, this one feels more agile than the bigger SUV. And also for an SUV, it feels quite agile with their big vehicles. Genesis rather goes to a, you know, very comfortable luxury approach here. And with their mid-size vehicle, they definitely, they definitely feel sportier and more or in, in the sporty directions also if you compare it to the German competitors. So their G80 and GV80 more against Mercedes E-Class and Mercedes GLE, where I feel that this one here is rather against the Q5 or the BMW X3 from, you know, the, the basic philosophy. Cruise control set here at the steering wheel and then I select here with the hard button. That is actually really cool. And let's see the lane keeping assist, if it's keeping me in the lane. Yeah, so far quite well. Now it's a little left bend and not too intrusive, too intrusive yet. Blind spot monitors also with this vehicle. There's like a warning triangle. Let's see when that Volvo is overtaking us now. There we go. So there's a red triangle then in the side mirror. And then also get this acoustic warning if I hit the turning indicator. And by the way, when I hit the turning indicator, it feels so sophisticated when you put it down. That's really, really nice, really awesome. This engine here, you do feel that's just good to have a little bit more displacement. And if you compare this 2.5 liter against the two liter in the G70, so it's just, you know, more calm on the one hand, at the same time, it's also more powerful. And yeah, that's of course a good thing. Noise insulation here so far, so good. 120 kilometers an hour, so like 70 miles an hour, typical motorway speed. And I don't have to raise my voice that much. It gives me a very comfortable and pleasing experience. Here, especially the fabric seats are so much more comfortable than the rather stiff, you know, surface from the animal skin. And yeah, so that is also a thing that adds to the comfort, definitely. And agile driving wise, it doesn't shake up too much. So once again, doesn't lean too much into the, in the, into the corners and so on. Feels actually quite sporty. Steering feeling is rather direct. So um, let's see how natural it feels. Yeah, it could feel a little bit more natural. However, I think it's quite okay. And also I feel in the GV70 a little bit better than in the G70. Maybe they tuned that already. So I do feel quite one with the vehicle already. And, oh, that's a set attacker there, okay, that's, that's a little bit smaller. But the thing is really, it's an easy vehicle to learn. You get in the vehicle and you immediately feel at home and you get along very well. So let's now accelerate from 90 kilometers an hour to what, let's see. That's 120. And about that engine sound, by the way, you can also go to the main menu and really glad to have this lower control unit because I don't want to, you know, put the, my fingers around that screen while driving. Now I set the cruise control. When I'm a little bit distracted, it's always um, definitely safer to do and go to settings. And then there's here active sound design and let's put it to the enhanced mode. Let's just to that. Yeah, that's interesting. So. That's now like, whoa, are we in a V6 now? There's also a V6 available, but we're not in that one here. However, the 300 horsepower we have here, definitely more than enough for this vehicle. Um, but, yeah, I feel also that this feels a little bit better sound-wise than it does in the two liter four cylinder of the G70. You gotta check out that video. That was a little bit weird how that sound actuator sound was there, so. Yeah, maybe here put it to normal or minimized or something and then I think it's absolutely fine. You're also in traffic on the motorway, feeling good. Overview, good view to the rear, also to the sides. And I really have to say, this is such a good package they're offering. So exterior wise, they can easily keep up with the Germans. This is of course a matter of preference. Interior wise, the build quality is great. And they find something, you know, like a compromise of modern things and um, you know, 
still real buttons and things to use and this is just so much better than like the way Mercedes is going now at the moment. So this one more like in the direction of um, where BMW has been heading and this one here also feels so much more sophisticated. The suspension is really good, 19 inch wheels. I would also advise not to go for the 21 inch wheels or the 20 inch wheels. Stick with these one, they will deliver best comfort. So good compromise of comfort and sportiness. And I feel that also the suspension they use here is somehow better than in the bigger models or if that, you know, reduced weight or something also plays a good role in that. So with the G80 and the GB80, I sometimes had like this push in the back, like when you're going over some uneven parts of the road, like, whoa, that was not feeling that sophisticated, it's definitely. From what we've seen from the interior and also you're now driving wide, this is the best Genesis model at this moment. No doubt about that. It feels most sophisticated, it feels most modern, yet at the same time, they've kept some of the elements we are happy that they kept them, you know, like the manual climate, climate dials and so on. It feels really spacious on the inside. It's very comfortable here on the German motorway, also long term. Yet at the same time, it's so much more agile than their bigger models. So this model here for the Genesis lineup does it all. It is the best, I mean, compromise sounds so bad, but it, it takes the best of both worlds. You feel like you would be driving a big SUV without having the disadvantages of having like a super large SUV. By the way, here the top part of the windscreen has like a, um, you know, it's like a, it's like a, like a ting ting or something. So and um, this transition then is really smooth. This blue is Thomas blue color of the of the windscreen, and therefore most of the time I don't even need to use the additional shield, and this really protects against the top part of the sun also a very clever detail or a very clever feature so they really paid attention to the details with that vehicle and i just love that lane changing by the way feels very natural and once again i'm really happy with the steering here i wasn't quite happy with the steering in the g70 but here obviously in the newer model they worked more on that exactly what i told them with the g70 they should still update well, there is a face now for that, but obviously they, you know, forgot to put more effort in that. Let's also push that drive mode selector here and set to sport mode and also enhance sound. And yeah, this just sounds more spectacular. And from, you know, like 90 kilometers now and we're already at speed, let's accelerate it out. Seventy kilometers an hour, yeah, good acceleration, very nicely done. That was very cool, and also here, super silent here at, at higher speeds, and also very stable. I feel this one is even more silent than the sedan version, which is you know not logical because it's the SUV and stands more against the wind. But once again, that proves the thing that this is here, yeah, kind of the most sophisticated Genesis vehicle and. To me, it feels even more silent and also like the, you know, the bigger brother. Yeah, they have this active noise cancellation, but you maybe know that I'm not such a friend of it. Here, by the way, augmented reality in the GPS display here. This is also pretty cool. So um, they have, you know, like a better signal of like which lane should I really pick. So There's a camera image and together then it's showing me, okay, this is like, you know, the exit you need to take also very good feature so um, yeah definitely um, really no matter what the price is if you ask me at the moment which generous vehicle would you pick overall from all of them haven't driven the all-electric one yet like the g80 all-electric which is coming but so far we really have to say the gv70 and will be you know this gaps in the hood and this overlapping hood there in the front which I could criticize but here by the way once again the cameras when you turn, hit the turning indicators sees another blind spot feature basically from the side mirror cams so yes this hood overlapping um, and yeah the infotainment system software can always be better um, most of the time probably you will end up using Apple CarPlay and Android Auto but it looks at least cool, you know, especially uh, this is my favorite view of the infotainment system with that kind of screensaver mode, so to speak.
but I really have to search for anything that is wrong with this vehicle. There's just hardly anything wrong with this vehicle. It drives very well, so well built, I'm really, really impressed. And I have to say, if we consider now Messe GLC, Audi Q5 and BMW X3, they are all excellent vehicles, no doubt. Volvo XC60, um, of course, as well. They are all very, very good. But this one here is definitely among the best premium mid-size vehicles, period. So, thumbs up here for the Genesis team. And also good for me personally, of course, that they have the leatherette seats in the base option. And they also offer these fabric seats here in the sport line. So they also learned more about that. So it will be very, very interesting if they can succeed on the European market. They are trying to attack the European market right now. They're already popular in the US and in Europe. It's so tough to compete against all the BMW Mercedes in the premium segment. Will it work? Hmm. If you then think about the pricing, so you can easily live with an entry model of this vehicle and it's already fully packed almost, you know. There's always something you can pick more, but if you compare it then, you know, to the other offerings on the market and you pay like 50k euros or something and you're done. And you can easily save 10,000, 15,000 euros or something to a competitor, which is, you know, similarly respect. So, and then it's not worse in any, in, in any aspect or something, you know. So uh, the price performance in the premium segment here is definitely unmatched. Fuel economy, you have to calculate with some 9 or 10 liters or more kilometers. So something below 30 mpg. A new mid-size EV SUV is coming up with the Genesis GV70 EV. This vehicle here is available with combustion engine, both petrol and diesel, but now there is the electric version. And you can see it here with the closed grille, but isn't this dot structure? And with Thomas and Autogefühl for you, we'll tell you all about you need to know with this vehicle, including the driving part. Burgundy is this very interesting color here for today. We also have some other color choices, for example, a red one or a matte green, military style, or my favorite, the matte gray. That looks best, I think. Other than that here, the closed grill, you can see the, ta uh, the tail lamps. That's the other side, right? The front lamps here, very slim. Daytime running light integration, that looks very modern, so quite modern styling in the front. Do you like it? 4 meters 72 or 186 inches is the length here of the Genesis GV70. The EV version is no different. So from the exterior, you cannot differentiate it from the side profile. The direct competitor would, for example, be a Mercedes GLC, but that's not available electric yet. Well, here 20 inch wheels mounted for today. And we can see that we have the chrome frames around the windows, has an elegant styling and a very interesting design line right here. Suspension-wise, the EV version directly comes with the otherwise optional ECS, that's the adaptive dampers, and here also in the preview function, so it scans the road ahead. And it sometimes does beeping sounds. <laughs> really clean design here also in the rear with these tail lamps that are very horizontally drawn and very slim. And did you know that this is also a performance SUV? It has all-wheel drive, one electric motor in the rear, one in the front, 4.2 seconds is the acceleration figure to one kilometers an hour or 62 miles an hour. Very impressive. And also for efficiency, they both use on the rear and the front axle a permanent synchronous motor. And that means they are more efficient. But usually they are always running even if you're rolling. But they can decouple the front electric motor when rolling. So there's then less resistance. And then usually when you're just like running rather straight, just the rear electric motor is active. So it is predominantly then a rear wheel driven car and then front electric motor when you really need it. The top speed is 235 kilometers an hour or 146 miles an hour. So they also thought about the German Autobahn. <laughs> yeah, we Germans need the high speed, you know. So, um, and we'll test the German Autobahn, of course, with this one here today. Something that the Genesis logo can be mistaken for a Bentley logo or vice versa. What's your opinion on that? Tell me in the comments. And there is indeed here a small frunk. Oh, ain't that cute? Well, at least you do have one. Would that be a relevant factor when buying an EV? Tell me in the comments that as well. 
and talking about the engines in general about the general vehicle here general vehicle well this is the ev version 77 kilowatt hours net battery that will bring us a range more or less 400 kilometers or 250 miles maybe a little bit more we'll see about that later it also features a heat pump so we don't have so much range losses in winter times other than that the general platform here of the vehicle offers a petrol engine 2.5 or in the us also a 3.5 liter v6 and also a 2.2 liter diesel charging port is here hidden in the front that looks cool right and it has an 800 volt architecture that means charging from 10 to 80 percent state of charge when you have a proper dc charging station in less than 20 minutes and this is indeed segment leading and turning indicator check that looks quite fancy doesn't it and just in the rear it's not that spectacular the reason here they keep it in the lower part is that when the hatch is open you can still see it that's also mandatory or by by law actually by the way we also caught a pink vehicle color <laughs> it's also interesting doesn't it this is the key fob and it also features the remote parking feature and that means when you close you have to close it then have this hold button then you can well I almost ran over michelle's foot now that was close <laughs> so um let's say you have a narrow parking lot or something then you can remotely park this car in and out and hey stop stop i have to use the force ah yeah sorry i had to go for this one door closing sound tricks you quite good have heard better ones but definitely definitely heard worse ones what's cool here the door look at that it really continues all the way to the lower area that means yeah you can easily skirt your ground when it's you know when there's like a bump here or something but the good thing is that the whole area here in the entry area, area there it always stays clean and here it already starts what i love about this vehicle here real controls this is the real deal you have real buttons and they are from good build quality i really love that also how the contrast stitches are aligned here and so on that makes a very good impression and you can also see it here at the steering wheel you have real controls also the jog here for the volume for example and it looks premium it feels premium at the same time you offer a classic user interface because we as humans we need feedback and we need to touch things yeah i literally mean that <laughs> and yeah that's the cool thing and it shows you can make a modern vehicle but still keep a classic and good user interface seats they look quite comfortable i'll soon test them however one strange thing here with the ev version you have some fabric in the head restraint but main part is animal skin and for the petrol engines you can get leatherette seats for example well why not here maybe at a later stage i don't know seating position here with 189 or six foot two there is still some headroom left and there's a nice comfort feature here when i turn on the ignition steering wheel comes down seat goes forward and this is then the final seating position and yeah it's really disappointing that especially for the ev version they only sell a top trim and then with animal skin seat that doesn't make sense at all um yeah but let's see if that only accounts for europe we'll have to see about that seating position itself from the ergonomics is actually quite decent you have a nice comfortable seating position and once again the quality how you know everything is thought out and planned that makes a very good first impression as well interior overview really clean here from the surfaces and so on and here wrapped tightly 14.9 inch screen really horizontal widescreen format well of best with this vehicle is that they once again show it looks modern it looks clean yet at the same time we have a real climate dial which you can feel and turn and that's the way to go i think this is actually a good way they found yes you also have the screen here for example to activate the seat uh, the, the steering wheel heating for example or the seat heating right here so they don't have knobs for everything but for example here for that or at the steering wheel i've shown that to you as well and also some hotkeys that you can quickly access the map for example um, it's important by the way in a way that you still use the car internal gps because when you use that one you can have preheating for the battery for fast charging that won't be possible with google maps or apple carplay then here in the lower part we have also this control unit 
where you can control the infotainment system while driving. It's also a good function to have. Driving mode selection, soon tell you more about that. Another real volume jog, and this everything resonates very well with that quality. And this is in the drive mode selector, drive, reverse, and neutral, if you ever need that. And then here for the parking. And also when you open these um, things here, like here, oh, that it feels so smooth when you open that. I love these details. Two USB-A chargers. You can also fit a second phone there. Also, inductive charging is in the front there. But for the Apple CarPlay and Auto, you need a cable connection. Cup holders are adaptive and also keep the bottles very tight. This Genesis water, the new Genesis water. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So, um, yeah, that works very well. And then we have this middle console armrest. And let's see, it's yeah, it's quite long. Therefore, it does shake a little bit. Underneath, however, it's nice that we also have this felt covering here and more space there. It's really dark, but there is a lot of space. Infotainment system. What I really like is that I can control it while driving also from below with a turning knob and the screen stays clean, actually. You can, however, use the touch function as well. That is actually possible. Then what I want to show you is, is a new feature, first time for a Genesis vehicle. It has the terrain mode and when I use the driving mode selector and put it in there, so you can have a snow mode, for example, so the power on the electric motors is then reduced. And they have really nice visualizations for that one, right? That one looks cool. And oh, and they also kept the burgundy color then here, in this case, for the vehicle. Oh, we're going for sand. So that's actually um, quite cool, nice to have. The car internal map is, well, not the coolest one, not the most modern one. As I said, the advantage is that here then you have a preconditioning of the battery when you pick a charging station in there. Other than that, you would go for the Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. has a nice integration right there. And then, of course, here use the Google Maps and so on. The two instruments are clear to read. The only thing that I think is missing in the middle part is a big digital speedometer. So that could be better in when you switch through the driving modes. The instruments also change in the sports mode. Also, the side bolts of the seat change, by the way. So that looks actually quite fancy. And here, once again, you can also select the terrain modes. I do that with the button in the middle console. Also interesting is here that lower right part. So there I can actually change the recuperation mode with the shifting pedals at the steering wheel. And then I can go for a maximum Recuperation, maybe I have to start the, start the engine for that. So, um, there we go. So, um, there we go. Yeah, and it's always beeping everything, you know, so you can have maximum recuperation or then lower it. And when you press and hold them, look again at the lower right, you switch from the auto mode to the normal mode, and that is actually also affecting the recuperation. There's also a head-up display available. Rear seating area, what comes to my mind visually is here, contrasting seat belts that looks really fancy doesn't it maybe not for everyone's liking but yeah i do like it isofix at the outside seats each let's soon check the leg room but here the door also in the rear we have some soft touch so good build quality and also the lower part there the door sill is really low there at the doors so you don't make your you know lower trousers dirty here at the entry to this all staying clean leg room when i'm driving here as a tall driver um it works it's not abundant actually you cannot change the back part here here it works very well with the recess but when a tall driver is driving not too much legroom headroom however is actually totally fine then although it is ev it is also a platform sharing with the ice models therefore there is yeah, like this, this, this small step here in the middle part but it's more or less okay so in the middle position you can sit but it gets close with the legs yeah, maybe not the most comfortable one, but it works for shorter trips, for example. There's also always a nice feature here that you can move the passenger seat from here, the so-called gentleman's function. <laughs> yeah, you know why. Um, but that also helps when, for example, when you're sitting here in the rear and want to control something. In the middle part here, you can slide down the couples. They're not adaptive at all, though, so not that helpful then in this case. But overall, a decent rear area. Oh, and not to forget, this lever here changes the back part of the seat. So then you can make this one a little bit steeper. Well, that's maybe too steep or more 
backward but yeah i think the backward position in this case is the best choice you would have put like this when you need more trunk also Porsche Macan style opening here for the trunk. Otherwise, there's also this cool function that when you access the vehicle with the key in your pocket, you just stand still and then it opens automatically after a few seconds. Here then the trunk space. You don't lose too much here in the EV version. Width is a meter of 40 inches. The length is a little bit less than a meter of 40 inches. So a little bit missing right here. And the total height here is about 72 centimeters or 28 inches. Um, well, it could be higher underneath the cover here. This is, you know, like a free cover without rails. Um, but you have more space here in the wheel arches. There the trunk gets a little bit wider, but you can see here when you use this one here, it's not high enough for you to, well, this, yeah. So not ideal. I would like a little bit more depth underneath this cover here. You can put smaller things in here, but for a charging cable, I think that won't even work. What's interesting that you can, oh, that's, that's nice here that you have this, hear that? Like, click, and then it's secured. And then you can fold the seats. So let me put in the head restraint first here. So folding the seats like this, and they fold directly properly. So Genesis suggestion for the charging cable is this box. It is really properly secured here. I mean, it's like I can't even put it up without damaging the trunk. So you have to be really certain where to put it. So it will stay in that place most of the time. And then it's here underneath. Welcome to Thomas's driving lounge in the Genesis GV70 EV. And the cool thing they paid attention to here is sound design, active sound design. Off is just silent, as you might know it from other EVs. Then you can go minimized, normal or enhanced, like how strong it is actually pronounced and ooh, I'm not, I, I put it to enhance that you can really hear that and then by these you can actually pick what you want to have and S engine is provides a sporty engine sound for electric vehicles so this is then basically emulating an, interesting emulating a combustion engine and let's listen to that Then there is E-Motor, provides natural electric motor sound for electric vehicles. Natural electric motor sound. So more like... And then there is Futuristic, provides a futuristic driving sound for electric vehicles. Okay, that's more like Engage. So what would you prefer? All silent? A more futuristic sound, a subtle sound, or more like a growling engine-like sound. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, I would like when there is a sound that kind of gives you back a natural feeling of something that is alive in a way, you know? So I like a sound when it sounds like growling and you can like really feel it in a way, you know? but. That's what I'm always talking about. Why can't you just pick like, hey, today I'm feeling like V8. Today I'm feeling like inline six cylinder or whatever. And maybe today I will not have sound off. So, but this already comes close to that. So I think it's uh, actually a, a nice idea. So um, it would be cool if we could do a live vote, which one we, um, we leave now here in our review. And it's by the way cool when I control something like that, I don't have to like reach over here, but I can do that here with the, with the turning knob. So maybe we leave it to normal and put it to the S engine so we don't have it that much, but just a little bit, you know, let's, let's try it with that one, actually. So I follow the Apple CarPlay Google Maps then here for our guidance today. We can now see something of the ambient lighting here, for example, around this area, also inside of the doors a little bit, actually quite cool. I also um, put up the, the brightness for that. Steering feel is actually quite decent. So it, let's see how it changes throughout the driving modes. You have to reach down here when I go, for example, to the sport mode. Is it stiffer? Yeah, yeah. So in the sport mode, we have a little bit more resistance. That's actually a quite nice feeling. Also the bolsters um, come a little bit closer to you. You have to stick quite a lot. I would say it is um, most comparable to a Mercedes driving feeling from the steering. 
um, whereas the Audi ones are, for example, more progressive. And the BMW, mm, they are the X3 would be the comparing model to that, is also a little bit sporty in the, in, the, in the feeling, I would say. As for the driving modes, in the sport mode, you have more response from the throttle. You also have a boost mode function here. For 10 seconds, you have then a maximum boost for this vehicle here. You can activate it at the steering wheel. And we'll also try that out very soon when we go to the German Autobahn. First, here's some cruising. Therefore, we can also leave it then in the comfort mode. It's actually quite silent here. We'll also test that at a higher speed later. The adaptive suspension does a good job. So it is relatively sporty from the setup, I would say. We also have 20 inch wheels mounted. That also accounts for this sporty driving feeling. But indeed, it feels very sophisticated here. So the combustion engines already, you know, the, these versions there from the GV70 already told us that it's a very, very good competitor here in the mid-size premium SUV segment. So it's definitely on par with, you know, BMW X3, Mercedes GLC, Audi Q5, and all of these have their specialties in some certain areas. And to me here, the cool thing is really that they offer us a classic user interface. So I can really just easily change the temperature while driving. And especially Mercedes is going away from that. Uh, BMW also with the new OS8 then as well. Audi is a little bit more classic, more traditional than in, in this case. Yeah, then brake feel. Because it's always the thing with electric vehicles, do you still have a proper brake feeling? But so far, satisfied with that, it's actually a quite uh, quick response. And I already talked, um, talked about the recuperation modes. You can leave it, for example, at level 2, then you have some notable recuperation already, but it's maybe not too much, like g force on the passengers, and you can also go with the iPedal, maximum recuperation, then you really have one pedal driving. So I leave the foot of the throttle, and there's strong recuperation. So you can do that, it really depends on what you want. And then, of course, when you use the brakes, also the regenerative braking is being activated. I talked earlier about efficiency gains by decoupling or using clutch on the front electric motor as soon as you need more regeneration then the motor is also you know being engaged once again for example when you leave the foot of the throttle then there's some recuperation at the rear axle but then you have more recuperation needed and then the front one is also being activated once again uh, at the end of the test drive, we'll do like a longer loop now. We'll also talk about the final real-world energy consumption here. Um, if you know the estimations of this vehicle of the EV range, then are also being confirmed. Let's now hit the motorway, push the throttle. Yeah, we're having the turning indicator be uh, uh, beat. <laughs> Yeah, that's what Michelle and I do when we are on driving events, yeah, nice. <laughs> so let's put it to the sport mode and hit the German Autobahn. Yeah, there we are with the sport mode. I also have this enhanced sound now. You can have something of the active sound design. And what about the acceleration of this one? So I'll start at 40 kilometers an hour and accelerate it out. Let's go. <laughs> One thirty, and we're already at the back of that vehicle here, GLA. Wow, that was 40 to 130, and now when we're already at speed, at 110, let's go. Woo! 150, 170, that is super quick, and wow, also really high speed stuff. 200 kilometers an hour, 125 miles an hour, and now hard on the brakes. Full recuperation plus using the real brakes and good braking performance indeed. Wow, that is good agility like that. And also lane changes here. That's nice. Adaptive suspension set on the sport here. Note then here in the sports no uh, sp sp sports mode. Sports a sports note in the sports mode, right? <laughs> so here another lane change. Also, I can see here this another blind spot. Um, functionality, when I have the right turn indicator as the camera on the right side, 
it's at the mirrors and left side turning indicator. The left camera is also a very nice feature, definitely. Yeah, that's really nice here. And, and I mean, there's good noise insulation, also at higher speeds. The car feels really very well in control. Comparing the combustion engine model here with the electric one, here we have the low center of gravity. So that helps actually in agile driving. Just when we are in tight corners, of course, the car is pushing a little bit more. But the driving feeling is definitely comparable. Both the combustion engine and this one here, very good in the driving indeed. I mean, in the US, it's especially attractive to pick the 3.5 liter V6, of course, for this engine as well, you know. But it depends on the charging infrastructure. It's really just a pity. I mean, this EV here drives so well, but the so far offering of animal skin only in a modern electric vehicle, it's that's actually almost this is actually a deal breaker, you know. So I really hope they will have some markets uh, worldwide where they also offer these leatherette seats or whatever. Um, also for the EV model, um, yeah, we can just push them for that, for a little bit more sustainability. But driving feeling wise and comfort, this is really in, in every respect here a very, very good driving feeling and experience. The question is just, what about the agile handling when it gets, you know, when it gets a little bit tighter? That's where we're heading now. Now, and here we go. More agile cornering. Once again, a good steering feel indeed, and the suspension is doing a good job. It's also once again compare the comfort mode versus the sport mode. You're already in comfort mode. You have quite good feedback from the car, so that feels quite natural. Let's go to the sports mode. When there are some bumps in the road, by the way, it does get more bumpy, basically, from the feeling when you have the sport mode on. So then you would rather pick the comfort mode. But of course, for winding corners, then the sport suspension is more fun here. That's what I mean. So when the road has some damage, then it gets less comfortable. So once again, the difference between the ICE and the EV they are really comparable cars. Um, it is some kind of a trade-off indeed. You have more weight, but then the center of gravity is lower. <sighs> Which one is more fun? Yeah, it's here it's really a tough question. We have some vehicles where the EV is actually even more fun to drive. Um, here I'm not exactly certain. As for the seating comfort here, when we have been driving a little bit longer, by the way, um, yeah, I feel that the seats are fine from the ergonomics but oh this looks really cool with the fork here um, but they're not segment leading for example the new perforate synthetic seats in the BMW X3 are to me uh, more comfortable and also the Volvo seats are great in the ergonomics the Volvo XC60 would also be a competitor which has better ergonomics in the, in the seats you know when we have this longer band and accelerate out the steering gets a little bit light than when accelerating out. Still, I have a little bit more punch from that rear electric motor, but yeah, it's definitely a lot of fun and always very spontaneous throttle input. I mean, you can easily forget that this is also a performance SUV, you know, like with just over four seconds here in the acceleration figure, you know, that used, used to be high powered six cylinder or even eight cylinder engines in these mid-size SUVs. Wow, beautiful view now over the Frankfurt area. German driving in the day around the this the um the Taunus here, the mountain region close to Frankfurt. Now here recuperation and because we went uphill first and now all the way downhill and this would be another use case for example when I don't want to have my foot on the brake all the time. I just increase the recuperation level but it does offer strong recuperation. So for going downhill here, the first recuperation level is already enough, actually. This adaptive recuperation, by the way, when you press and hold the pedal, then it also adapts depending on if there's a car in front of you. Oh, there's another um, in this GV70. You know, the colleague is filming that. So let's go back to the comfort mode because it gets a little bit bumpy here from that sport suspension. So this adaptive recuperation, when the car is in front of you, then there is recuperation. When there's no one in front of you, the car is rolling. So that would also be an idea. And yeah, meanwhile, I think it's good when you can choose these modes and then you can just pick the driving mode where are you most comfortable with. 
and also yeah depending on how far we're going down you know and then I can also I'm, I'm not doing anything with my feet at this moment so you can just control it if you want to have it a little bit stronger or not and of course the energy consumption after this motorway high speed driving and also going uphill went up quite a lot you know I do a stronger recuperation now with the left pedal but when we're going downhill we will gain back a lot of energy and then we can tell you more about the final real-world EV driving range for today. And here we go, real-world range. So on our test loop we had topography changes, but also high-speed motorway driving here on the German Autobahn. That of course put the consumption a little bit higher than usual. But it's also a realistic thing, at least in Germany. <laughs> and then we end up at 23 kilowatt hours on 100 kilometers. That is some 35 kilowatt hours on 100 miles. In this case, then only a range of 330 kilometers or 200 miles, also with somewhat cold temperatures, not too cold though. If we would leave out the high speed motorway driving, we would more come close to some 20 kilowatt hours on 100 kilometers or some 32 kilowatt hours on 100 miles, and that would bring us closer to a 400 kilometers or 250 miles range. That is the same also when you have like an Ionic 5 or the Genesis GV60. Um, or the Kia EV6, only that this one here, because it's a little bit bigger, has you know some range disadvantages. So it is not the range king, more king in the quick recharging, if you have the according charging station. A very special review with the new Audi Q8 e-tron with a comparison of the SQ8 Sportback e-tron. Here with Thomas on Autogefühl for you in 4K full screen and full length. Let's go. Where does it come from? How does it sit in between the competition? Tesla Model X, Mercedes EQE, SUV or the BMW iX. Let's take a look here at the front. And that's one of the things they have majorly changed. Exterior changes, technology changes later on. Here we can see the mask here around and then the single frame grille inside. Before it was the Audi e-tron, their first electric big SUV, and now they say, hey, we have made so many e-tron models, we have to position it in the model portfolio. That's why it's now called Audi Q8 e-tron, to see this is approximately the size also of the petrol version. From the inside color here, this is a special edition where you have the inside color with the matching exterior color here in Kronos Gray, but you can also get it in different colors, for example, uh, blacked out in the black package as well. And also the frame is in different versions available. In the SQ8, it would be bright, for example. And the new design feature is also here, two-dimensional Audi rings. They take away the three-dimensional chrome look. They say mainly for design reasons to make it more modern, up-to-date. What do you think about it? Tell me in the comments. And then they have two versions. The background is always black, but then here there's like a gray ring, but you can also get it in the brighter styling. It looks very clean. However, I was also a fan of the real things you could touch, you know. So far in this segment here, it wasn't the most efficient vehicle overall. They have now improved that, for example, by increasing the aerodynamic efficiency. So now CD values of 0.24 or 0.26 depending on the Sportback or the SUV version. The Sportback is always better. Then here in the lower part they also optimize the air breathers or these air curtains. So the air goes in here, goes through the wheel arch. This has been optimized and also how the wind is flowing in the underbody of the vehicle. Here at the insole of the grill, this one opens on demand actually just when cooling is needed. Another efficiency measure. Styling-wise, by the way, here this lower part is more accentuated in the S line, which we have right here, or than in the SQ8. Otherwise, in the base advanced line, it's a little bit smaller. And only from below, you can see the wheel spoilers, and they are actually one of the best efficiency gains. Very interesting, right? Because they channel the air from here to the side away from the wheels, and that is bringing a lot of gains in efficiency. And have you actually seen this new detail, this light strip above the Audi rings, right there? There we go. This looks really amazing, right? It's an option. And when you take a closer look right here, this is not the light strip. It is where it is mirrored in the paint and it originates below. And that's the reason why it's legal also in Europe. 
4 meters 92 or 194 inches is the length of the Q8 e-tron and wheels come from 19 to 22 inch wheels these ones here are 21 inch also in an aerodynamic design then here blacked out wheel arches are always painted either in vehicle color or in a contrasting dark gray tone so they have also optimized the siding here and also the model name is always indicated now here at the b pillar other than that you have the base suv shape or then the sport bag shape and both versions suv or sport bag are available then in different powertrain versions with different power output what have they done with the batteries massive upgrade the so far biggest battery has been increased and is now the small entry battery. And the bigger battery now is a completely new, even larger battery. So now you either get 89 kilowatt hours net for the 50 model or for the 55 model and the SQ8, you get 106 kilowatt hours net. So that's an increase by 25 or 20 kilowatt hours depending on the battery, so massive increase. So you get plus 100 kilometers or plus 60 miles of range with this upgrade now. And what does that mean for the real world driving range? We'll test this vehicle thoroughly throughout the next days. And then at the end of the driving part, we'll tell you about the final test consumption and then tell you about more, more about the real world range. But it's way better than before. That's clear for sure already right now rear design here light strip goes all the way through modern tail lamp design and then the lower part here in the contrasting style this diffuser in the lower part is here more accentuated and this is always the case in the s line or in the sq8 driving dynamics wise also massive changes reworked suspension air suspension is standard but the front axle is you know a little bit stiffer from the setup especially and then you can get on top of the normal air suspension a sportier air suspension setup that is standard for the sq8 or then also for the s line for the s line you can then again depick it but not for the sq8 yes this is the channel here where you know more details even before you go to the dealer and recharging the small battery 150 kilowatt peak 28 minutes 10 to 80 percent state of charge and the bigger battery, 170 kilowatt peak, and 31 minutes from 10 to 80% state of charge. And that is indeed very good as for the improvement because the batteries have become larger. So the time didn't really change that much, but since the batteries are so much larger now, that this is also a significant improvement. And here, when you press this button, the charging flap opens, and there you have AC and then DC charging below. And here for the passenger side, you can also get an optional AC charge. A really cool solution. Also, the flap is opening, closing, very premium alike. And a feature you would usually see, for example, where do we know it from? Yes, for example, from Rolls Royce. Here inside the wheel, the caps here, they can be turned actually. And yeah, you can maybe show it off to your friends and do like, you know, like a Ferris wheel or something here. That looks also quite cool, right? But the function, of course, is that it stays upright even while driving. Let's take a look at that. And turning indicators, cascading style here. That looks always really fancy, doesn't it? And you also get the cascading turning indicator style for the front, at least when you order the most expensive headlamps. And acceleration figures, six seconds for the so-called 50 model, the Q8 e-tron 50. Then this one here, the 55, is 5.6 seconds, a little bit quicker. Both have two electric motors, one in the front, one in the rear. And then the SQ8, that one at 4.5 seconds, with three electric motors, one in the front, two in the rear and then also enables even better torque vectoring these here the all-way drive models do torque vectoring by brake intervention the sq8 can do torque vectoring by one motor at the wheel even just spinning quicker that's of course a better form of torque vectoring and now i mean look at that scenery here the first scenery was amazing already and that one I mean, yeah, that's just beautiful. And also with beautiful color. This one is now ultra blue, a typical Thomas blue we call it here on our channel because this is my favorite color, this, you know, these light blue colors. This one in here is now the SQ8 e-tron 
and also the Sportback version. Once again, you can get an SQ8, the sporty version, for both the normal SUV version and the Sportback. So it doesn't really matter. You can freely pick SUV or Sportback and SQ8 or normal Q8. Here, then the SQ8, you can see, Stanley comes with the bright mask around here in this light gray that looks really beautiful. And I would actually pick it in this very combination. I think also the ultra blue together with the bright accentuation right here just looks amazing. Also the bright um, inside grill in here. However, you could also go for an SQ8 and make the mask and even the grill in black if you prefer that more sinister look. And I also think it's a right choice here to go for the Audi rings, which are in white here. Always black background, but white then on top. It just looks more present. And I've seen some other vehicles, for example, in my back mirror yesterday or when they were facing towards me. And when the Audi rings themselves are dark, it almost appears as they would be like diminishing. So you can't really see them. And that way you can still see, hey, you know, I'm driving an Audi. Styling-wise, S9 and SQ8 are similar right here with these wider openings for the air curtains. Otherwise, they, you know, they are just like, like this in the size. But then exclusively to the SQ8, you get wider tires. And then they also have to make the wheel arches wider, like here, this bit. But then again, they have some aerodynamic function right here so the air can flow through. Now in the side profile, also 21-inch wheels, but different as styling. And here we also have the Sportback version to show you. Falling roof line, really sensual, also with stronger hip area. Would you actually go for the standard SUV version or would you rather pick the Sportback? Which one do you prefer styling-wise? Tell me in the comments. Then air suspension is here always set on the Sportier node, but you also get it, as I said earlier, with the S-line trim. And then you can depick it, but you cannot depick the sporty setup for the air suspension here in the SQ8. However, it is still an SQ8 and not an RSQ8, so they still have some compromise between sportiness and comfort. There is no RSQ8 for the electric version. You have to go then, once again, for the petrol engine still. But here I think this combination works very well. Usually I'm more a fan of the normal SUV versions, but in this case here, yeah, I think the Sportback just has this sportier touch. But is it any bad? Is it a bad compromise as for the interior, rear and trunk and so on? We'll find out later in the interior part. And in the rear, once again, a stronger presence for the Sportback version, especially in that three-quarter rear perspective right there cool look, isn't it? And then the SQ8 version has the silver contrast right here. I think that works very well with stamped in e-tron batching here. The lower part, this diffuser, is the same in the S-Line and also in the SQ8. So also on the rear, is it more the SUV style or Sportback for you? Tell me in the comments. The white Audi rings, I think once again, work just better. They have more presence here also at the rear. And although they have this two-dimensional look, they are three-dimensional in a way and to be touched at the rear. What about this batching? They have indeed also changed the batching. On the right side, there's now never anything. 50, 55 model, you can't see anything right there. But on the left side, a normal Q8 e-tron, standard one, would have this batch, just Q8. If you pick the S-line for the Q8, it would be like this. The red Audi Sport logo with the Q8. And then if you have the SQ8, it looks exactly like this. So this here basically indicates an S model or also an S line. And it's not placed, you know, this old S line badge at the side. That one is also gone. Key fob here with the e-tron badge. It's a really nice key fob. It's not new, but still does the job very well. Then door closing sound. Really solid. Love that perfect door closing sound and the interior materials here. Soft touch on the top part, a nice microfiber insert here in the S line. This is also softer for your elbow, but could be a little bit softer, I think. And the lower part, this was better recently in the Tesla Model X, where this was also covered here. It's just, a, you know, like a hard pack material. And then here, look at that. These are the digital mirrors. They are an option and they cannot be bought in the US. And that's it's, that's actually a good thing because I think they're a bad idea. Yeah, I, everyone, they're placed too low in the vehicle. They should be higher and more central towards the driver. And in general, normal mirrors give you 
and 3D image of your surrounding, basically, to me, in, in your head. Even though if European mirrors are also better than the US ones that are kind of like zoomed in in the driver's mirrors, it's also a, bit, a little, little bit weird. But these camera mirrors are always, let's say, less realistic, even in nighttime. I think it's overall a bad idea indeed. That's what your, what's your take on that? Seating position, the seat ergonomics actually is pretty good. Here, one meters 89 or six for two, still leaves a lot of headroom. A panoramic roof is also available. Steering here, in this case with perforations at the side, S-line, also red contrast stitches on the ins inside. And this volume jog here, for example, real buttons at the steering wheel. I love that. There's no other material than animal skin available. And the same also counts for the seats in the US. And that's, of course, really hit and miss. In Europe, we also get microfiber on the inside and on the outside for our S-Line and the SQ8 and the base fabric seat. But in general, Audi needs to step up the game. Tesla Model X is completely animal-free. BMW iX offers a lot of different choices. And also Mercedes is better in this respect as for you know, offering also some things worldwide, for example, for the EQE SUV. So this is where Audi is lagging behind. They have missed the chance to change something here in the interior. The interior setup here is really clean indeed. You have this integrated screen, 10.1 inch, the other one 8.6 inch below, and they can also play together in a way. E-tron batching right there, this very interesting structure on top of that. And then you have digital instruments as well, Audi virtual cockpit, and also how everything you know, is processed. The build quality is really very nice. It has been more or less the same setup from the beginning, and we also know it like from Audi A6 and the Audi A7, A8, and so on. Digital instruments, clear to read, I really love them, and the map can be here full screen. However, the thing is, it's only the map from the car internal GPS, and you cannot get Apple Maps or Google Maps in there or something. And the head-up display is always a great little helper. Special to the Q8 e-tron interior is here, the shifting reverse and drive. It works, but you have to question yourself, why? Why not make it classic? And this flying middle console here, Hmm. Meanwhile here, this part in between is a little bit narrow for big modern smartphones, at least when you use this cable connection here. Underneath you have cup holes that can also be pushed inward and you have more space to offer power supply. To me, too much clutter actually. And on the left part here, this is then the inductive charging pad, like on the side. Well, here this armrest is very well attached, you can move it left or right. And then another place for your smartphone could be down there then. I really like the infotainment system because it has this simple main menu. The other one I don't fancy that much. And the car internal GPS has a nice satellite view. Here today also on a very beautiful volcanic origin island. Here when we zoom out, it's the island of Lanzarote in the Canaries. It's a really, really beautiful one here. That's Lanzarote and these are the other Canary Islands, and they are actually, you can see here, um, on the coast of Morocco, almost, you know, towards the equator. So it's really nice and pleasant here, always when weather and good for filming. And the lower screen is my favorite capacitive AC unit. You know, I always prefer real buttons, but for a screen solution, it's relatively easy to handle, like with clicking or sliding, and it's large, so you can miss the things. And for example, when you want to um, adjust here, like left and right, you do like the swiping, closing gesture, and then you have everything synchronized. Seat heating is, for example, here in the lower part. So this, uh, to me, for a screen solution, a good one. This is the drive selector that you can change the driving modes. That is not placed that well. It should be different or maybe at the steering wheel or something. And once again, what I mean with the digital mirrors, usually you look here for the side mirrors, the normal ones. But here now you look down and it's always distracting. You lose attention from the road. So if you use screens for this solution, they rather should be put up right here. You know what I mean? Very nice comfort indeed. Enough headroom with 189 or 642 and also enough leg room. Good package and also decent comfort while seating. And you fold down this and then you have, for example, cup holders. They are also adaptive like this and then in the lower part here, it's a very nice climate unit. And listen to that. With nice clicking sounds, although this is also like this capacitive area. And the trunk or boot, wait a minute, when we later talk about the frunk, 
we say trunk or fruit. Sorry, I had to go for this one. <laughs> well, but here for the trunk or the boot, here the normal length is like one meters and seven or 42 inches. And the width here is, well, between, you know, between the wheel arches here even. Yeah, that's even quite good. Once again, one meter seven or 42 inches. So good measurements. And also here in height, this is like 71 centimeters or 28 inches. Capacity is 530 liters for the sport bag. 570 liters, a little bit more here for the SUV. Cool thing is that here, when you lift this one up, you have even more space, once again, for charging cables or replacement tire. And you can also easily fold the seats from here for the maximum length, which is then here at over one meters 80 or 72 inches. German electric vehicles tend not to have a trunk, but this one does offer one, for example, in here, space for the charging cables. Why not? That's actually decent. And I wonder why other competitors like the BMW iX or the Mercedes EQE SUV don't have one. Hmm. I don't know. Then does this one here, since we are in front of the hood here, affect the petrol engines in any way? This one here, the Audi Q8 e-tron, is the EV version. Once again, an SUV or sport bike, then different power train outputs and so on. But it does not affect the petrol range, the normal Q8, SQ8, RSQ8. This will remain the same. They do have something in common, technology parts and so on but it will run parallel the EV lineup and the combustion engine lineup. Sportback interior now in the rear. What is the difference? Headroom wise, I had like in the normal SUV version, like this space above my head still. And here, I do fit in here, but then I can just put a hand over my head. So yes, you lose headroom here in the Sportback version in the rear, However, tall adults can still sit here without problem. So it's not a big compromise, only if you have Michael Jordan guests in here in the rear. By the way, about the front, Sportback SUV, no difference in the interior. And also SQ8 with the normal Q8, also basically no difference in the interior. What about the trunk of the Sportback version? opens really high as well. I can stand underneath it, no problem. And you have the same great access to the trunk. Here, this one is fixed. You can remove it here, however, completely if you like. And you see, it's very well usable too. The thing is, you're not limited in height right here, just limited a little bit in height right here. So only if you have long things, but at the same time are super high in the back area, then it would be a problem. Otherwise, I think you can live with this compromise, can't you? Welcome everyone. Let's accelerate. Stop. That was zero to 100 kilometers an hour or 60 miles an hour with the 55 model. So the official figure is 5.6 seconds. We got to check the time code below. Reasonably quick two electric motors, one in the front, one in the rear. And wow, we have a beautiful scenery on the island of Lanzarote. Wow, this is really impressive. And let's start with the strength of this model. And one of them is definitely noise insulation. It's really silent as for the wind noises around. And one of the weaknesses is, especially at lower speeds, you tend to get some low frequency sounds, especially when you're running over some bumps and so on. And they haven't changed that with the facelift here of the model. So that is on the con side. And the thing is that you especially hear them because it's otherwise so silent. You know, you won't hear them when you listen to music or something or when you drive faster, but when you drive at slower speeds, then they come quite apparent. One of my favorite strengths of this vehicle is the steering. So here, left and right, it's super precise. And they have also updated it in this very facelift or update because they have made the front axle, let's say, you know, in a, you know, in a more reacting, stiffer way and also changed the steering ratio. So you have to steer less and Audi steerings in general are already quite progressive. But here then, they are even more progressive. So small commands are directed to transport to the road. At the same time, also when you're driving straight, it is a very relaxing thing, definitely. So you can both drive comfortably in parking in and out and also in a, in a very sporty way. I like when there's no dead zone area here, 
and the car is really reacting very precisely. They've also updated the air suspension and this vehicle we're driving at the moment basically has the suspension setup from the air suspension of the SQ8. That means you can either get this base air suspension or pick the sporty version of the air suspension. And in that case, especially the front axle gets a stiffer setup once again. And we feel that when turning in, that feels even sportier than before. However, I have to say, when you now think about would I need to change my Audi e-tron to the Q8 e-tron because of the suspension and driving dynamics? No, you'll be just fine. The main reason to switch to the new model is indeed the increased battery size. So as for the driving dynamics, it was great before, now it is also awesome. So great driving dynamics always with this vehicle no doubt. So here now, also in some bands, you have a lot of fun actually. It's really, really a lot of fun to drive. Suspension is also indeed doing a great job. If you should go for the sporty setup of the suspension, I'm not exactly sure. So if you want sportier driving fun, yes, you can already, ha already have that with a normal suspension setup here. This one, when you want it even stiffer, but I wouldn't say it's really necessary. I'm always a fan of combining comfort and sportiness. It's still doing that. But of course, with the normal suspension setup, you would have a little bit more comfort still. Here we are also with 21 inch wheels and they also serve the purpose of being visually interesting, yes. But then again, when you have some bumps in the road, you feel them more in your lower back and something. Well, we have great scenery here for our driving part today. No doubt about that. So also when you think about efficiency, and comfort, 19 inch, the smallest wheels would be way to go. With 19 inch wheels, it has the best A rating for the rolling resistance and also gives you the best comfort. So it's always a trade off, definitely. You have to think about that. In general, about the competitors, ooh, it's a lot of fun here going over these humps and so on. Great volcanic landscape. When we think about the Tesla Model X, here we feel that the suspension is a little bit better in the Audi Q8 e-tron than in the Tesla Model X. And also in the X we had 22 inch wheels and these also reduce the comfort while driving. So Tesla Model X with 20 inch wheels would also be better. Also the steering input here is so precise and so much fun to steer it around. This one here is really, really good in the Audi. And also if you think about the BMW iX, or the Mercedes EQE SUV or EQS SUV, the Audi offers the best natural steering input. So I feel that it's most fun to steer the Audi. So this combination of steering and suspension is just awesome here. Probably one of the best things about this vehicle. Let's talk about the driving modes. Here, when I'm in dynamic, dynamic, dynamic mode, then the suspension is a little bit stiffer. In comfort mode, then it reacts a little bit softer actually to what's happening. So that's the way you can always fine tune it a little bit more. I tend to keep it in the comfort mode and you can also pick individual modes. For example, you can um, you know, go to yeah, this is when, when CarPlay is running, it's not switching there uh, visually. So for example, you can go to the individual mode and there have like suspension on comfort, but then the steering on dynamic that you have more resistant in the steering, but that you have the softer suspension. That would be, for example, my recommendation when you, you know, when you drive this car for a longer period of time or something. Other than that, the shifting mode, as we usually call them at Audi, D or S, usually defines how much are the RPMs turned up for the next shifting. Here, of course, it doesn't really have an effect on that, but the thing is that the throttle input is just changing. Here, like, for example, in D, slide throttle input in S, there is like really instant throttle input and that is indeed just more spontaneous to drive that one. When you have something in the front of you, then it's also about recuperation and you can either do it with the brake pedal, then it's recuperating, or use the shifting pedal here and go for a stronger recuperation mode. In general, their philosophy is not really about one pedal driving, it's more about letting it roll and when you lift your foot off the throttle and have this strong recuperation then more is happening and 
here you can also delete it again, so to speak. But the normal driving mode is hardly any recuperation. It's more this rolling or coasting effect. And uh, when you, for example, have this cruise control set, then it's automatically doing that and so on. But they rather want you to have more like a combustion engine car feeling that you use the brake pedal yourself. And it's always a matter of philosophy. I tend not to say that one of these is good or bad. It's just a question of how you prefer it, actually. And if you like it, you can also then activate it here and have a stronger recuperation right, right there. So, yeah, actually, why not? So in driving, I think it's doing a phenomenal job indeed. It's, you know, you really feel connected to the vehicle, low center of gravity. That's the thing that you don't feel the weight of this car. These EV SUVs are super heavy indeed, especially when you make the batteries even a little bit larger. At the same time, same time due to the low center of gravity, you don't feel a negative effect um, of that that much actually. So now once again here on that road, let me show you another acceleration when I'm now doing like um, 45 to 90. Let's go. Uh, let's go now. There we are. So that is also going really quickly. It's so effortless indeed. And the whole steering feeling, it's always a lot of fun, but you can always just go back to normal D-driving mode, pick the comfort setting or just the auto setting here, then the car is adjusting accordingly. The air suspension also, when you are in the dynamic mode, the air suspension lowers a little bit. So it's also then better for fast driving. You get more stability and at the same time more dynamic uh, character or it goes up again when you are in the auto mode or in the comfort mode and so on. Then about the efficiency, hmm, that's still the thing. So our results so far already is saying that even though some things have improved, it will not be the most efficient car overall. What will it be at the end of the day we will find out when we drive even further. But now let's compare how does the SQ8 drive in comparison to this one here. Now the SQ8. Woo! And 100. Whoa! Whew. Okay. That's a notable difference. <laughs> Whew, yeah, so two electric motors now in the back and although on paper it's just this, you know, like one and a half seconds uh, difference you, you, that you save approximately, even less, the difference was 5.6 versus 4.5 then here now. So, um, yeah, barely a second difference, but it feels way quicker indeed. So. Uh, get an instant push definitely from the get-go so this ele additional electric motor really helps a lot. Interesting is that suspension wise from the setup when you get the normal Q8 e-tron with the sportier air suspension in the S line and then also stick with it it has the same suspension setup here than standard with the SQ8 so that's also then this stiffer setup here and we have more precise steering because especially the front axle has been stiffened up. But there is still a driving difference and that is resulting from A, wider tires here in the SQ8 and B, here in the SQ8 we also have the dual motor setup here in the rear, so a triple motor setup in general and that enables a better torque vectoring. So here we have an active torque vectoring and this active torque vectoring can actually turn one wheel for example here when I'm going now in, on, in the left corner and I'm accelerating then the right wheel on the outside here the back wheel on the outside can get more power and kind of push the car into the corner but the other models when you have just two electric motors so one in front one in the rear this is done by brake intervention and has been the same recently shown with the Tesla Model X plaid model that also then gets the additional motor in the rear and then you also have active torque vector. So that's the main difference. So the SQ8 will still feel sportier. And 
once again, the best thing about these vehicles is the steering is just so direct, it's awesome, you know? So you don't have any dead zone area. It feels crisp, you can keep your hands at the steering wheel at all time. It's hardly a situation where you have to grab over because you have to steer more. You always are in control. One more time from 70 to 100. Plop, that, yeah, that was already exceeding that. Wow, so uh, it's really very quick. Of course, once again, no comparison to the Tesla Model X Plaid. That is just uh, yeah, beyond limits, but very quick acceleration here too. And it is definitely more than enough. Then driving modes, we can also go back to the auto or the comfort mode. Then the air suspension is going up a little bit again with more dampening comfort, it's softer. This tarmac here is very rough, that's why you maybe also hear that's a little bit louder then, but that's not from the vehicle, that's really from the tarmac then here in this case. You can also use it for normal cruising and so on. All the assistance systems work very, very well. This is here the adaptive cruise control, and the good thing is you can activate or deactivate the active lane keeping assist just with a click of a button. And that's rarely what we see in the very, very new modern user interfaces. So I feel it's actually a good thing that this one is in not the all new platform as for the user interface. Here, just like this, then Adaptive Cruise Control says no lane guidance or click again and then I have lane guidance. And for example, when I here steer a little bit left, car keeps in and very, you know, very smooth process actually so really fun of these assistance systems but just once again with the digital mirrors i'm just not a fan of it at all too small place too low down again us uh, viewers won't care about that at all because you get the normal mirrors anyway and for everyone else i can just tell you don't buy this option stick with the normal mirrors they don't bring you much more range or efficiency gains that's that's a marketing myth it's not not a big difference. You know, when you have good light conditions, it's of course better. As darker as it gets, the more problematic it is, I think. And you don't have this like realistic image of, of your surrounding with that. So you're not just aware. And for example, um, when you're looking straight now, and let's imagine there would a car appear near like close to me. And even if I would look straight and there is a normal big side mirror, I'm still aware, it's like I'm looking straight, in it, but I'm still somewhat, oh, there's something moving in that big, big mirror. Ah, ah, okay, there's a car. But here, with the, with the screens, you have no awareness at all of what's happening unless you directly look into it. So when I'm looking straight and something is happening here, I realize nothing what is happening here, like not at all, once again. I have to intentionally look and concentrate on the screen. That's not, that, that can't be a good thing. So new tech, yes, please, if it helps us, but no thanks if it doesn't help us, if it just makes things more complicated. And that's one of the case right here. But the best thing is that this vehicle here is all about the drive indeed. And from the driving fun, from the driving behavior, steering input, suspension feel, the combination of comfort and sportiness the Audi Q8 e-tron and especially even more the SQ8 e-tron they are really top of the segment as for this driving fun and driving behavior that is really so well done indeed but it also has some other shortcomings as we told you earlier in the interior review for example that the uh, other manufacturers like you know Tesla goes all animal free on the interior that's way more looking forward for example the other manufacturers have better um, offerings there well and range efficiency gain and so on this will be super exciting we did one test with the normal Q8 e-tron yesterday the 55 model and we also do range tests and here today with the SQ8 for a longer period of time and then compare these both consumption figures and then we can tailor the real world range and if they can keep up to the competition this is to come then later on putting it one more time here in dynamic mode because i'm getting off the motorway here noise insulation like wind noise and so on is awesome really really awesome that's great and wow you're now off the motorway in that event 
and that soya is so much fun indeed. And I mean, look at that, it's, it's so effortless. It's, it's a heavy vehicle indeed, but the drive suspension wise and so on makes it still so much fun. Of course, at one point you can't deny physics. So even though the, the weight is put in the lower part of the vehicle, when you have really, really tight corners, at some point it does push you out of the corners. That's, that's just physics. So electric vehicles are a lot of fun to drive, yes, and they especially feel effortless when accelerating. But when you have lightweight sports cars, you know, then, or in general, like a, you know, like a combustion engine SUV, which is like maybe like four, 400, 500 kilograms lighter, they do feel better in tight corners indeed, because the weight, again, you just can't deny it. So um, it is a lot of fun, definitely, but you know, more, especially like when you have some longer bends and so on, the tighter it gets, the more this weight still plays somewhat a role. Here these roundabouts, they are a lot of fun. Left and then the other combination again here out. So would I actually choose the SQ8 over the normal Q8 e-tron? Of course, there's always a hefty extra price. Um, I do feel that the SQ8 is a little bit more fun, yes. So this torque vectoring helps and also the wider tires, they do make a difference. So it is actually more difference than I have expected. And in general, the thing is with the electric vehicles, when you pick between the different horsepower tunes, the difference is not as large as it used to be with combustion engine vehicles. You know, like when, it, when you compare like a normal Q8 to an SQ8 or so on. We have felt the same with the BMW iX and to the M60 version. Yes, it is more driving fun. It is more extreme in a way. It goes more into the sporty direction, but the differences are not as large as they used to be. So when you're thinking about a clever budget decision, then it is of course not the SQ8 and you will be totally fine with the normal Q8 e-tron, definitely. If you want that extra spice of driving fun and the budget is not really you know, that important, then the SQ8 will be totally fine. And what I always love about the S models of Audi, in comparison to the RS models, here the S models have a suspension setup which is still suitable for everyday driving life. And in the RS models, usually there is some kind of a compromise in a way of you have to go in that very sporty direction. You also want that then from an RS model, but you do lose comfort. Here with the S models, it's still the case that they say, hey, I don't need to lose comfort, you know? And at the same time, when you go for the normal Q8 e-tron, you can always depict that sportier suspension setup, for example, when you went for the S-line and have it a little bit more comfortable and also tune it with the tires. Here now, once again, like uh, with the Q8 e-tron yesterday, we had 21 inch wheels. We could go bigger, but we could also go smaller. And my tip is always maybe go a size smaller to keep up the comfort. One more topic then here in driving is Sportback versus SUV. Yes, this happens to be the Sportback version here now, but yeah, it's a design thing, you know. It maybe has like a minimum effect then on the weight distribution because here then it's a little bit lower but it doesn't make a huge difference. The bigger difference will in a way be that when you go for the Sportback version, the, uh, the drag coefficient is better actually. So you will have a little bit more efficiency then. Yeah, but also not in a way that it's a super game changer or something. So if you go for SUV or Sportback in driving, it doesn't really make a big difference. So rather pick that one that you like better design or styling wise and just think about if you can live with some of the you know, like height gains in the trunk we've shown uh, to you here with that Sportback version. But yeah, once again, that doesn't really matter so much. Great fun ride here once again. Now the question is, what about the final consumption for both vehicles and the rear wheel range? And about the lighting here, some nighttime driving shots. I know you love to see that. Look at that, they are oncoming vehicles and it's said that they are not blinded. 
so far no one complained because sometimes people complain they maybe flash their lights or something but you can see although they were oncoming vehicles now again from left to right this span from left to right or right to left is a very wide field where the light is being applied if i turn on the high beam whoa <laughs> we can see everything um, so that's really impressive indeed but even the normal beam look at that really impressive field of light i would call it and yeah as i said so far no one complained i hope it's also the case that really no one is blinded and now to our final consumption and real world range test for today so we have driven the 106 kilowatt hour battery the big one with the Q8 e-tron 55 and also with the SQ8 Sportback e-tron. The first consumption with the normal Q8 e-tron was about 24 kilowatt hours on 100 kilometers. Here with the SQ8 e-tron a little bit higher, 25 kilowatt hours on 100 kilometers. That means both round about two and a half miles per kilowatt hour for our US guys. So the real world range then is 440 kilometers for the Q8 e-tron, or 420 kilometers for the SQ8 e-tron. That means 270 miles for the Q8 e-tron or around 260 miles for the SQ8 e-tron. Overall, an acceptable result. The consumption is still quite high, also if you compare it to the competition. However, now, since the battery is so large, it evens that one out. So no, it is not the most efficient one in the segment, but it is the one that also offers one of the best driving experiences in the segment as for comfort and fun and this combination indeed. So you have to think about which one would be more important to you. Audi SQ8 and the new Audi SQ7. Both now coming again worldwide with the 4 liter V8 bi-turbo engine. And of course everything here, exterior, interior, and the performance driving experience. Join us in full HD, full screen, and full length. Let's go. Here in the front, we can see a very strong styling with this single frame grille. And you'll also see that the SQ8 here has a wider frame around the grille than the Q7. You'll soon see that. Here also, not only this very beautiful Misano red color, you can of course get different colors, but here there's also the additional black package, where you have the black accentuations here in the shiny black in the lower part and also around the grille. Headlamps start with LED as standard, also beautiful modern signature here you can see, and the SQ8 optional then with matrix LED. There's a difference then to the SQ7, where you can get these headlamps also standard LED, but then not only matrix LED, matrix LED, but exclusively for the Q7 in here. Also optional, these laser lights, even more elaborated high beam function. The length of the Q8 is 5 meters, 16 foot 4 or 197 inches. And the difference is just that the Q7 is about 5 centimeters or 2 inches longer. They both share the very same wheelbase, it's just that the Q7 has a longer overhang in the rear and then also the option of a third seating row. A really cool shot with both here, you know, parallel right in the side profile. You can see here the wheel arches, always in vehicle color for these sporty models. One small slight difference here. The SQ8 comes with 21 to 23 inch wheels, whereas the SQ7 comes with 20 inch to 22 inch wheels. So the SQ7 then a size smaller and also the tires themselves, they're a little bit wider here with the SQ8. So a little sportier setup, but they both share the same base hardware. They come standard with an adaptive air suspension and also the rear axle steering is now included for both models. So five degrees in the opposite direction than the front wheels. So that reduces the turning circle by about a meter. Of course, also gives you more agility at lower speeds, at higher speeds than the rear axle steers in the same direction up to 1.5 degrees. And the rear comparison right here, and this is, you know, quite obvious that the SQ8 has the sport you're starting here with the falling line right here. And also the light strip that goes all the way over the vehicle. Very beautiful job. And again, the black accentuations also here in the lower part. 
And then we can see the SQ7 with the more upright style that you have a little bit more space on the interior. And now the trunk comparison, we start with the SQ8. And the cool thing is really because it's not this classic SUV coupe, you just lose a little bit of the height right here. That's what you lose in comparison to the Q7. The liter figure here, around 600 liters in the capacity. So you can very well still use it. You can see it here. Now the SQ7 here, the capacity is 865 liters. So more than 200 liters more than the SQ8. And we have removed, first of all, this cover, which would also automatically go up and down. And I also removed here, you know, this splitter. And we start with the interior overview here today because SQ7, SQ8 is just the same right here. Horizontal stress, also then here with the vents. A lot of black piano local use. However, here the styling elements in carbon fiber available here for the S models. Quattro logo will be illuminated at night with the ambient lighting. That's a very beautiful thing, definitely. The screen setup is as this 12.3 inch digital instruments, 10.1 inch central screen and 8.6 inch screen like this for temperature control. Now let's take a look at the differences. First of all, the door closing sound here, SQ8. Wow, nice sound, although we have the frameless windows and sometimes there is not such a good door closing sound when there's frameless windows. This is of course an emotional feature, but great closing sound here. However, there's also the optional feature of the soft close. Ah, magic. Yeah, but the thing is when you have the soft close, then you also have this motor working against you when you, you know, suddenly open the door, for example. Then instead of the doors, straightforward design, then Alcantara used at the inside of the doors. Nice job. And these carbon fiber inserts. You can very well use also these door pockets. And then the front dashboard design, as we said, is similar, SQ8 and SQ7. As for the seats here, the dark design, different colors available. And in Euro, for example, you would start with the sports seat with separated head restraint that also features Alcantara on the inside. We would recommend that. This is an optional, the Super Sport Seat or the Sport Seat Plus, which has these integrated head restraint. This is a standard seat in the US. And sadly, this one only comes with animal skin spec, designed with the gray. To me, a little bit you know, lighter and more likable, but that's of course personal preference with the Alcantara and also with the seat and with the S stamping. But of course, in general, in the front, pretty similar, these two cars. And when I get inside right here, like this. See, there's a little bit more space here as for the A pillar. Um, headroom wise, also really plenty. A little bit more, of course. So, if you're really tall and want a panoramic roof, then you would have an advantage here with the SQ7. But in general, the difference in the front between these two cars are rather minor. Plenty of legroom here left. So, and both cars share the same wheelbase, so legroom is not really the issue. Um, yeah, and very comfortable here, more comfortable than in the big sedans or so on. And although this is here the SUV Coupe, still a lot of legroom, but I feel even that the seat is a um, little bit more forward to, you know, ensure the third seating row. So it seems like we had a little bit more legroom in the Q5, Q8. Again, the wheelbase is the same, it's just how the seats are being positioned. A lot of headroom, even more than in the Q8. And it also goes back on to the, no, to the further part. You can also slide this forward and backward. And again, here this um, individually done. Um, there's a difference here to, you know, you can have a different lever here. This and one difference is a four liter V8 by turbo. Cylinder on demand, mild hybrid, both inside for fuel economy. But for power output, you have here 507 horsepower, 770 newton meters of torque. And the acceleration figure is 4.1 seconds to 1 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. Welcome to Thomas's active driving lounge with the Audi SQ8 versus SQ7. We start with the SQ8 here on the test track and let's just floor it out acceleration wise and do some dynamic driving. Let's go. Well, that was already 160 kilometers an hour. Wow, that was spectacular. You could already you could see like how the car is lifting up in the front. Really cool. It's of course a heavy SUV, but still for such a heavy SUV, 
good driving dynamics. We have the EC Sport mode. Actually, we have the EC Off mode, have we? So here we're about 50 kilometers an hour and see in the slalom. And yeah, this again, look how precise it is steering wise. Incredible. We just exit here. Wow, that was pretty cool. So very precise from the steering wheel. Um, so there's no dead area here whatsoever. Every single command is being transported. Really amazing. The steering setup is yeah one of the best there is, not only for SUVs, but also for cars in general. Of course, here in these corners, when also when accelerating out, you feel it's a rear wheel bias from this all-wheel drive. So uh, there's no understeering or something, but you definitely do feel the weight of this vehicle. It is a big SUV, so you cannot compare really to sports cars, yes, but we also have this anti-tilt or anti-roll control in here. So considering it's a high-built car, you see it's hardly leaning at all. It stays really, really upright. And by the way, we can also um, see the difference here. Um, ESC Sport, that's you know the one step. So if we go to the slalom here in ESC Sport, let's see what the car is doing. So sometimes I feel that it's like there's some in, uh, interference. Oh, one of these I got. <laughs> so when I put it completely off, so I hold it, that's of course just for you know racetrack purposes. Then I can do a little bit more with the vehicle and it just feels a little bit more loose. And there you also hear some tire squeaking so yeah subtle difference definitely but interesting to experience it and again when I do some accelerating out of the corner here like this yeah very smooth very nice also sound wise so really amazing what this big SUV can do here difference to the RS Q8. The RS, RS Q8 was even more screaming from the exhaust. Hardware-wise, it's different on the front axle, so the front axle is a little bit crisper on the RS Q8. Uh, the hardware components then suspension-wise, they are actually quite the same. Um, so, yeah, this one is not as stiff suspension-wise, so a little bit softer. So we have, you know, let's say a little bit um, smoother setup in comparison so but here yeah, I mean no matter what you want to do it's very precise as we'll steam this one of the key features here so RSQ8 not worth 25,000 euros more definitely not this one is already coming very close but if you want it even sportier even a little bit crisper and stiffer then the RSQ8 would be fine however both SQ8 and RSQ8 still deliver a good comfort we're here in the sports or then the dynamic, dynamic mode and still we have a good comfort feeling and even if you just drive it in the outdoor and the in the comfort mode and so on here due to this optional anti-roll control you see it's hardly shaking up so even just in the comfort mode it's very sporty and at any time you can just throw it out like this not so much sound feedback like in dynamic mode comparison here dynamic mode yeah i think that got quite clear um, <laughs> also the rpms are turned up higher and so on shifting characteristics um, are being changed so um, very impressive what they've done here with this big suv so wow and now we switch over to the sq7 and interesting we have the more classic gauges here. The other gauges were these performance gauges, but you can just pick them in the infotainment system which design you want to have, but you can see both very clearly. Let's see if there's any difference in driving between the SQ8 and the SQ7. Let's just do the very same. Plop, that's 160 again and you really see you know, how these gears were hammered in. Very interesting. Um, <laughs> definitely a lot of fun to accelerate these out. And let's now also go into the slalom, see if there's any difference here. Yeah, I think uh, the ESC is ruling a little bit earlier, so let's 
test that was EC Sport. Let's test it with the EC off. Now EC is off. So let's see about that. Uh -huh, that's better. That's better, yeah. But yeah, I have to say, it does feel a little bit different, right? Michelle, what do you think? So to, to me, the SQ8 felt a little bit sportier. I think, you know, when you're just doing the acceleration, just running straight, you know, there's hardly any difference here. Except out of the corner. Yeah, that's very powerful. But I think in the slalom, there in the slalom, you did feel a difference. So first of all, I felt that the ESC would work earlier. Maybe it's, you know, it's just me, but um, definitely the, uh, the SQ8 had a little sporty notch, but I think you rather feel it when you really push it like you would have the test track here. On the normal open road, um, not necessary that you would feel a big difference. Here we get now a little bit faster in this slalom. Let's see, high entry speed, so I have to work a little bit more. Wow, but I mean, this, again, a huge SUV and you have very good control over it. So once again, this precise steering is something that is, yeah, to me, one of the coolest things here. Um, also here, let's drive a little bit faster. Lane change at about 100 kilometers an hour. Wow, so easily done once again. And also listen to the noise insulation. So when once again, accelerating out of the corner. Nice sound. And here, for example, typical motorway speed, 130 kilometers an hour. When I shift up, very silent. What a great noise insulation. So it's super, super silent in here. So this is also one of the things that is famous for the Q7 in general. This very good noise insulation. Yeah. And it's so relaxing to drive at the same time. You don't need much force in the steering, for example. So, um, yeah. Look at that. However, indeed, um, I'm a little surprised. I would thought I would have thought that they are exactly the same as for driving. They do come very close, but I think setup-wise, the SQ8 does give us a little sportier notch, so really holds what it promises just from the visual part. Doesn't mean that this is less sportier zone. And of course, there's always the limitation with these vehicles. You still feel the weight, you know, you still feel um, the heaviness of this SUV. Um, here in acceleration, this is just sports car alike, no doubt, but as soon as you go into the corners, then there is a difference to a low sitting sports car. You just have to know that, and that's something you can find out here on the, on the, on the track. And one of the cooler things is also with this rear axle steering, so when we're at you know at like these lower speeds, this is also why the slalom is working that well here at about like 50 or like 40 kilometers an hour, then the rear axle. Um, is really helping us and here for example also with a turning circle when we're driving a little bit slower so like this here I mean this is this is crazy it feels like that what we are doing a circle with a very very small vehicle it is so interesting to compare the different concepts x5 and ix totally different vehicles eqe suv and the gle totally different vehicles gv70 versus gv70 ev Essentially, the very same vehicles, just different powertrain, Audi Q8 and Q8 e-tron. They do have a lot of similarities as well, not as identical as with Genesis, but they are pretty much alike. So with the BMW X5 and the BMW iX, both have their pros and cons, so to speak. Overall, I had a little bit more driving fun with the X5, but I wouldn't mind either of them. With Mercedes EQE SUV and Mercedes GLE, the more classic approach in the interior especially just pleases me more in the Mercedes GLE. So here I would prefer the combustion engine version. Genesis GV70 and the GV70 EV, here it really doesn't make any difference. It's just about the charging infrastructure and your driving profile. The vehicles themselves, they are both a lot of fun. They are really good and of course the electric version also has the best fast charging features within this comparison. Audi Q8 versus Audi Q8 e-tron. They come kind of close. I really like the classic interface here in the interior. So they are so easy to control. They are not super new as for the whole layout and so on, but that's totally fine actually. And the driving fun also comes really, really close. So here I would also say is more again about the 
basic powertrain choice and infrastructure and your driving profile and so on. So with BMW, I would basically pick either. With Mercedes, I would go for the ICE version. With the Genesis, I would pick the electric version because that one has the advantage of the fast charging. And with the Audi Q8, Audi Q8 e-tron, there I think the problem is that the Q8 e-tron doesn't have a sufficient range as for this size of electric SUV. And if we compare them all against each other, I think at this moment the most modern offering is done with BMW X5 and BMW iX. The X5 recently facelifted. They offer the new sensor fin material on the inside. The user interface is still good, even a good compromise also between real buttons and touchscreen interface. Yes, they cleared some of that now, like the AC unit, not a fan of that. It's relatively easy to control still. And then Genesis is a good pick here if you want to go a little bit smaller actually than the other ones. And there, it really doesn't matter, both are very good choice. So what's your take here? Tell me in the comments and see our next comparison episode.